What's up? This is Chris. What's up? This is Kevin. And we're here for another episode. It's been a minute, and this time it wasn't. I mean, we did have s- struggles communicating to um, or lining up our schedules, but I think the time on this one was more because we've been deep diving <laughs> into yeah, something. Geez. We are going to cover what I've been referring to. I mentioned on on Quick episode this week. I appeared on Quick, mm-hmm. and in the middle of that, I mentioned. It's uh, close to the end, but yeah. Close to the end, I mentioned that there's a postmodern movement on the right. And some people have, have already talked to me and said that I'd call it more of like an anti-modernist or anti-enlightenment movement. And I would, I'd still stand by that a lot of it pulls directly from the postmodernist. But yeah, I agree that the the concept comes from anti-enlightenment, but that postmodernism is that too. Which brings me to the preamble of this is that whenever you get into politics or start talking about political stuff, which I guess we've been into from the start of this because all this was kind of coming down onto Lynn and Larson for their crap politics, pretending like they're just speaking from a place of absolute neutrality of truth and not understanding the that they stand they think they're just like on the center of all reality and and so they have no bias and i don't want to be that way either because i'm a classical liberal in general and a lot of these criticisms that come from this side i've said to, to kevin a couple times that a lot of people give credit to marxists and say marxists do have some good criticisms especially people on this side they, they say that sort of thing and I don't, I don't really agree with that. I think, I think Marxists <laughs> give crap criticism, but I think the criticisms that Marxists supposedly give that are good, these guys make them good, make them make sense. Mm-hmm. The reason I don't think the Marxists have good criticisms because I think their entire premise of of human nature is flawed from the start. So it's just okay. whereas these guys, I, I don't think that. But I mean, it, let's let's kind of get into it before getting into it. So like I said, anytime we we start covering this, and because we have to do it, Kevin and I were just saying. It's almost like we have to cover all of politics entirely just to do this. We kind of ran into that a little bit on the, on Jonathan Streeter's podcast when we're covering the cynical theories books that we got to go back to the beginning and define what liberalism is and define what Marxism is and communism is and, and fascism and what is and isn't fascism. Then there's all these disagreements inside of all that. And, And me looking at it closer, I have some sort of disagreements, some things that kind of popped up in my mind. So of course, Sitch from the Adam and Sitch show, and he's, th- those guys have had some brawls with some of these, I- I'm going to call them Pomo trads, post-modern trads. <laughs> I don't know how else to, to call them. Dark enlightenment types, but obviously- They're also called, a lot, oftentimes called the neo-reactionaries. Neo-reactionaries and dissident right. And mm-hmm. one of the hard things about that is just like there's all these different Marxists who think they're, they're all very, very crazy difference. The truth is, is each one of those terms is ever so slightly different. Because nobody we're talking about here is completely unified in in, right. in in the same beliefs, and so they, they could play that same game. It's like, well, no, nah, we don't actually believe that because you're actually talking about somebody who's ever so slightly different than the other one, and you just get into some possible thing. You can play that forever too inside of the more mainstream politics. For mm-hmm. example, I'll just shoot right off the bat. Like there, there there's a big thing right now going on trying to define what the big dang difference between a classic liberal a liberal and a neoliberal is right now Mm -hmm. and everybody's kind of pushing and pointing and saying no no, you no, you no, you no, you that and and i'll even do that the same so since that's that's kind of my camp i hold the classical liberal and get to the point where i have extreme disdain for what i might call like a liberal or a neoliberal and so all those sorts of factionings happen in, in all the other worlds too but um, one of the things I realized about all this stuff is I listened to like Marxists and these guys describe neoliberals. I, I kind of go, is neoliberal just a fascist? Like is, is neoliberal just a fascist and, and you guys came up with a term to pin it on liberals? You know, they would do all sorts of these sorts of arguments too. That's why Sitch from Sitch Adam so says 99% of the arguments are all just about definitions and, <laughs> and who, who has to take credit for what idea. I don't believe it's exactly fascist because it's only got parts of fascism in it. You and I have kind of gone over a little bit like what exactly is fascist. And and part of the whole fascist world is that I think there does have to be some sort of element in it of love of the state that you're in or love of an ethnicity that you're in or love of a, 
uh, nation or uh, what else would they put a family i don't know just some it's got to have like some sort of centered familial mafia <laughs> unit to it that's that's mm -hmm. insular but economically the corporatism is overwhelming and i would say classical liberalism was never meant to have that neoliberal like um corporatism like corporatism which is like a true marriage of the state mm -hmm. and and corporate and i think I think it's somewhat disingenuous to pin on liberalism, neoliberalism, although it's, it's not, I mean, I'll, I'll also take their points that your crap was always going to lead to this stuff. And that, that's, that's really one of the big main points of the dark enlightenment types is they say all of your liberalism was always going to go this way. Yeah. It's like, just like they always talk about everything shifts to the left and everything shifts to authoritarianism too. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it's that's kind, of kind of that's kind of what I've been thinking of. Like, what the difference is between a classic liberal, a liberal, and a far leftist now is all. It's like, how far on the spectrum of authoritarianism are you? Yeah. Oh, I agree too. And that's that's some of the horseshoe theory stuff. And these these guys will hate horseshoe theory stuff because they think no matter how much we act the same, the heart of where we started makes it totally different. <laughs> you know, what I mean? <laughs> so you can't be a horseshoe. But I mean, I think. On the authoritarianism scale, it absolutely gets horse horseshoe. You could mm -hmm. say it's not horseshoe in other areas. I was going to pull up what you're just saying. I'm um, inside of. There's a video by the distributist. The distributist is a YouTuber. I, I actually like the distributist uh, quite a bit, although he lands squarely in the camp of of these guys. Mm -hmm. The word distributist comes from some sort of like Catholic version of this trad thing, and the distributist himself is a ex atheist who's delved right back into Catholicism, kind of selecting Catholicism because it seems to be the most effective. There's a, there's a part of all this where they're very, very, very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And what religion they go with or whatnot is kind of just what's going to work, which is one of the areas where I call them a little bit pragmatic or postmodernist. This is a video by, by the distributors called A Gentle Introduction to Mencius Moldbug. Mencius Molbug is one of the big names in the uh, Dark Enlightenment, probably the biggest name in it, although there's disagreement with him throughout it. But Mencius Molbug is, Kurt, is Curtis Yarvin. Mencius Molbug is his, is his um, writing name. And so this, this kind of gives an introduction to some of his ideas and thoughts. Um, but this is one of the things that they're, they're jumping off of, and Kevin was just mentioning it, that they use a lot the writings of well it goes back to thomas carlyle a whole lot and spangler and spangler they both kind of have these large ideas that civilizations and kind of have a lifespan a lot of people have noticed lifespans of civilizations <laughs> but they kind of think whatever that civilization is is just going to be what that civilization is within that lifespan but throughout that lifespan both of them will notice that part of the rust or part of the the thing that gets bad about it is that it will move leftward and that's part of what rusts it out if it's mm -hmm. if it's stable at all uh jordan peterson will talk a whole lot about these civilizations he'll talk a lot about what's stable or not stable and, and curtis yarvin this mencius Molbug, he'll use the terms like there's two types of entropy there's fire and there's rust mm -hmm. and anything that's that's really crap. Like maybe you could say like Hitler's, you know, Nazism or whatever fires out, it flames out. So it's not stable at all. Whereas something like a liberal, our liberal democracy or whatever rusts really slowly over time. So there's still entropy. It's going to entropy, but it rusts and it just goes leftward, mm -hmm. which brings us to these three laws of Robert Conquest, which I, all of this, I actually think is true. I, I think it's pretty true. The three laws of Robert Conquest is everyone's conservative about what they know best. So if you know Star Wars really well, you get pretty conservative about Star Wars. Mm -hmm. You've watched that fight, but it could be any sort of thing in the world. If you're conservative about maintaining the thing that you like or know, or work well within or know the answers to and if some newbie comes along and says i'm gonna fix this all for you you'll, you'll be skeptical of them <laughs> but you won't be skeptical of them if you don't really know the thing that they're trying to change very, very much any organization not explicitly right wing sooner or later becomes left wing i, I think that's pretty true <laughs> um, 
I've seen it in my life. I mean, I think no matter what, I think that's just, yeah, it's kind of just the habit of forming and organizing. And then if something's successful, in comes the grifters, in comes the, the you know, the leeches and the ones who are going to try to come up with the reasons why they need to sustain off of it while not helping produce or, or add to it. And the simplest way to explain the behavior of any bureaucratic organization is to assume that it is controlled by a cabal of its enemy. That's a weird one, but um, he goes into it in more detail in this video, a gentle introduction to Mencius Molbug. But uh, I, I think that's just kind of talking about, you got to assume entryism is going to happen. Right. Yeah. And entryism is the Marxist term that obviously if you're successful and very successful, and living in some sort of free society, there's going to be people who and sneak in the back door and subvert. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Kevin and I have been talking about, maybe I put the clip here, cause I'm going to bring it up more in the future. There's a, there's a movie from the nineties called SLC punk. And the very ending of the movie is the guy who's been just a punk, but he had good grades in school, but he's just been a punk waste. Oh yeah. It was the dude that was in scream. It was in Shaggy. Yeah. From Scooby-Doo. Matt Lillard. Mass Matthew Lillard. All right. This is the closing scene after the punks had his friends die and just stuff didn't go so well for the punks in, in uh, Salt Lake City. It's... And so there I was. I was going to go to Harvard. It was obvious. I was going to be a lawyer and play in the system. And that was that. <laughs> it was my old man. He knew. So what else could I do? I mean, there's no future in anarchy. I mean, let's face it. But when I was into it, there was never a thought of the future. I mean, we were certain that the world was going to end. But when it didn't, I had to do something. I could always be a litigator in New York and piss the shit out of the judges. I mean, that was me, a troublemaker of the future. The guy that was one of those guys that my parents so arrogantly saved the world for. So we could fuck it up. We could do a hell of a lot more damage in the system than outside of it. That was the final irony, I think. That, well, this. <laughs> Fuck you, if y'all are thinking it. I guess when all was said and done, I was nothing more than a goddamn trendy-ass poser. That's the end of Salt Lake City Punk. I, I, I think it's kind of a, that, that's right at the Cathedral of the Madeline, downtown Salt Lake. But I mean, I think <laughs> that's, I, I probably want to reference it a lot and cut back to it because there's a lot of that going on on both sides here. And like I said, these guys, a lot of these guys came through postmodernism. There was one other sort of thing that I wanted to say just about where I land, where I start from politics. I know Kevin does a little bit, but I'll call myself a little bit R Roger Scruton, Scrutonian. And the reason I say that is he had a couple of different things that he said when he was asked what exactly his political leanings were. And he said he was a young guy in the sixties and he got to witness firsthand some rioter kids. And he saw the rioter kids being a bunch of hooligan idiot rioter kids. And he said, what am I? I'm not that. And then he had another thing that he'd always say was a slogan. It was like a slogan. And he says, the reason I, we can't ever do slogans and it's tough for us to do slogans is because my ultimate slogan is, whoa, 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 hold on here. <laughs> that, that's my slogan. And that doesn't rally the kids <laughs> very much. You know? But uh, the point of it is, is like a lot of these other political things too, is I don't pretend to be like somebody with the answers and stuff. In fact, a lot of times, like I'm skeptical of people with too much answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, not a lot of times, pretty much all the time, there's nothing I super align with right now. I'm listening and I was kind of poking around, but I know what I'm not. I know the things that I say, nope, 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 nope. But through the whole entire time through graduate school and after into like learning and reading about every new kind of thing, you, you go listen to stuff and, and you realize that there's all these different people who think they have stuff figured out. James Lindsay's talked about it a little bit, but he says it's like this type of, of Gnosticism or Hermeticism, which is these lefty types and then these new other right side types. They are all kind of playing this Gnosticism, Hermeticism game. And I think it was, it's a little tough to describe it if you get really into the details of it. And I realized that there's an easy way to describe it and it's through Nintendo games. And, uh, we were talking about the legend of Zelda, um, the legend of Zelda links. He's got the princess's dead. Maybe say that's your society or something like that. He's got to go around and find pieces of the Triforce. And he's going to go, when he finds all the pieces of the Triforce, yep. he's going to bring about the, the final battle. Mm -hmm. And that final battle will bring 
piece the you, you want to know something's crazy about that is when they were first inventing the triforce and all that stuff they were going to make that triforce a computer chip but then they oh, realized really? yeah but then they realized that that didn't like fit the fantasy of it well enough so they just called it the triforce but at first it was link going through that fantasy world was going to be kind of putting together the tech the well tech. that's interesting yeah because a lot of them get into that well, man that kind of opens that kind of blew my head open right now just <laughs> because i mean chris and i have been like going down the rabbit hole of, of how like how these these ideas on the right the postmodern right go and a lot of them go back to they they go back to like this uh uh like pre-modern type stuff which is yeah. but it's all but it's but it's interesting because it's, it's i mean it's almost like uh like the time machine hg wells who was you know he was kind of more of, of a lefty but anyway but like and globalist but but still kind of that idea of and i don't want to go way too far i'm putting or i think i'm putting the heart the cart before the horse here a little bit but when you said that i was like there's no way for us to not put, we, we knew from like, the start there's no way to not get in weird weeds but it's like this it? it's like this like combination of like <clears throat> you've seen a bunch of movies about it what's the new one coming out or uh, avatar so it's like this mi this mixture of high tech and and pre modern, like yeah. era type stuff. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of crazy. You just kind of, you just kind of blew my mind with that a little bit. Yeah, and, well, part of it is because some of the a lot of the people doing it are the very exact kind of. I'm going to use the word a whole lot. I apologize to anybody for using it, but I'm going to use it a lot today. Autistic. I've, I've even used it on myself in some sort of senses, but it's usually a joke word, and the, and the joke word is kind of like getting too hung up on details or too hung up on all these little well, nitty gritty things and and um but they're the te they're the technostics yeah well there's some sort of level two where it's like we're all worried about the future of ai because ai might be crazy but i i've had this kind of realization that the way some of these autistic type people have started thinking who are managing and trying to create these new functions and systems they've already trained themselves to think like AI in a way. So it's like we're already under AI <laughs> dominance if if the humans are already trained to think like AI in a, in a sort of sense. A lot of this stuff even kind of points to thinking about what neoliberalism was or capitalism was, was just kind of a type of tech AI technocracy of, of figuring out what works so well, so well, so well, so well that we've, we've, we've broken society. And that's kind of a critique of what happened in liberalism, that, that we have been on this, this trek to go back to the hermeticism, uh, the hermeticism, uh, another Nintendo game, uh, Castlevania, Castlevania two, you, you've got to go around and find all the pieces of Dracula to put Dracula mm -hmm. together and all sorts. So, so a lot of people are kind of like, well, we've always, the humans were just the force that brought the thing to, to that. We were just supposed to put all the thing together and bring it into existence. And when we bring it into the existence, yeah, and, and it, it, this all goes back to Hegel too. It's really kind of Hegel's belief of side is Horcruxes in 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 um, Harry Potter. Harry yep. Potter. It's in so many different things that that the the hero is the one who actually has to go find all the little esoteric pieces of knowledge, put them all together just right, and that brings about the final battle. So all these things kind of have like an eschatology to them. Like there, there's a end of world scenario in, in every single one of them. The Pomo trads most of their beliefs and like what we're going to do with politics don't have to be that ready or correct yet because they can just say hey we'll take care of that after the battle with ganon or the battle with dracula or the battle with uh voldemort we'll, we'll worry about it then you know we'll be ready to start sorting out and that's kind of i think it's a hand wave of a of a thing because they can come up with some ideas but then they can also go ah oh, well we don't really have to answer that because right now we're just battling stuff but but the whole idea of going and gathering the info I feel like everyone on the left or the right, the Marxist, all, all these people with these Hegelian ideas that they're going to bring about this final super state or this final battle of evermore, they feel like they, they've got to go find all the different little tricky pieces of esoteric knowledge that fits in. They got to they gotta read every weird little uh, philosopher from... 1920 something or 1830 something or 18 and they each kind of have their own but then the weird thing is like a lot of the different philosophers have a bunch of crossover and like the same types mm -hmm. of thoughts like i was reading a bunch of spangler stuff and, and i was reading in 1920 but the way he talked about societies just only being able to be what those societies are and produce what those societies were were the tillers of that society to create i was like this is so foucault 
It's Sofu mm-hmm. Cove just saying you guys were just going to be the thing that you have. But um, these right wing guys, they call it. So I, I'm very, very critical as Karl Popper was of Marxism because Marxism has that future telling thing. The Marxist historicism from their dialectical, what do you call material? Materialism. Yeah, dialectical materialism. That, that They think that through that, they can tell the future and the future will go through all these stages of capitalism and result right. in this final thing or whatever. It's it's future telling. But these right wing guys say, you know what, you liberalism, you neoliberalism people always had that same historicism going on, which is kind of like the the Francis Fukuyama end of history type thing of like, you're just going to get to this maybe utopian place of a perfectly liberal world which i i frequently joke and say kind of star trek the next generation was the the ultimate fantasy utopia of that they call it wig historia historicism mm-hmm. they, they point it back to the wigs and say that's a it's kind of like a conservative liberal idea that we will get to the to the end of history because we'll we'll have all liberalized so well that, and maximize markets so well that we'll just be in, in total peace. And I, I take that criticism to heart too. So, so many times we can see in American politics where everybody's just absolutely sure that Trump just sucks balls and Trump's going to the worst and everything he's doing is just screwing everything up. But then you get to have the, the great luck of a couple years later having your idiot in charge. So then okay. you actually have to answer, you know. Well, one of the things with like liberalism, especially as they call it liberal hegemony over the past hundred years or whatever is, you can point, you can critique all you want because you've never had to prove that you can lead. You've never had to prove that you can actually do it. And I think a lot about liberalism, like a lot of that Petersonian thing, a lot of that, there's this idea that like, maybe that's pretty good. Maybe that's about as good as it gets. Maybe your utopia can't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot to think about that inside of liberalism. And I totally agree it rusts. I totally agree it falls apart. I totally agree capitalism becomes corporatism. You got to maintain the garden a little bit, not a little bit, a lot. The answer is the, on the other side of it is most other things, the entropy's fire instead of rust, you know? Yeah. Um, the way I kind of look at it, I mean, just to just to throw in the the Mormon perspective, and uh, well, it's, it's the thing about it is, is it's it's and then it's not even just Mormon. It's I mean, it's Christian. It's uh, it's uh, I don't know, just even the observation of the cycle of of societies. You know what I mean? The life cycle. It you know, if it if it's true that we all can keep going left, just like the, like a like a a hand on a clock continues to go. Um, is it leftward? Is it? Is that? Uh, Goes rightward, doesn't it? Oh, uh, a clock. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's say it's backwards. Or clockwise, whatever. Or counterclock- yeah, yeah. Whichever. But I mean, just think about it in 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 terms of a cycle. You're gonna keep going left until you were you know, until you got 360. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, it's gonna keep going. It's gonna go all the way left. Yeah, until, the cycle of pride. Until it, it's the cycle of pride. That's what I'm saying. And I think that's one of the greatest concepts, you know, um, really elaborated very well in the Book of Mormon. But it, it's also in, in the Bible, too, of course, you know. And uh, I, I love that imagery, too. And then, you know, it ends up happening to where things break down. I mean, you're right. It rusts, it rusts out. It breaks down. And there ends up being a rebirth somewhere, you know. And unfortunately, you know, oftentimes it, it ends up coming at a great cost. Yeah. So... Um, we're going to get to, uh, remind me to get to, cause I, you know, I hope I get to it cause there's been so many different thoughts, but you and I have talked so many different times too, is that we have these systems that are human systems, you know, and the human systems can't be perfect. This is, this is a phrase that atheists should be able to get behind. Listen to the atheists. You, you should be able to get behind this. No system is trustworthy unless it's run by Christ. Now, atheists, you should be able to get behind that sentence. Why should you be able to get behind that sentence is even if you don't believe in Christ, you should believe that sentence, you know, because if you're going around and putting your trust in any sort of thing to be the, the savior of a thing and it's not Christ at the front of it. So, so sure, you don't believe Christ ever is there. Okay, well, maintain that same idea. Hmm. Don't, any sort of system unless it's got yeah, Christ running anything, it. anything else, you know, anything else is just is just. Human um, error, human systems. Yes, stuff it's anyway. it's human it's human politics. It's um, it's you know, whatever drives humanity, and I don't think that the true benevolence has ever really been there in in within humanity completely. 
so in this video, this is a good introduction. Like I said, Distributist covers um, him. And, and going through Distributist, he, he can link you to other people who kind of do other descriptions. Um, most of M Molebug's stuff, he wrote it, and most of it was 10 years ago. And you got to give him credit for being way on the front lines of this. I and mean, that's mm -hmm. why some of them are so grumpy about Peterson, because they think that he kind of hit the stuff before Peterson did, even though Peterson was right, his book Maps of Meaning back since forever ago. He wrote this mostly in a blog called, what's it called? Un Unqual um, unqualified, unqualified Reservations. Reservations. And it's it's got this longer, I'd say this one letter, it's kind of a long letter. And then you can also find some people who covered it online called an open letter to an open-minded progressive. And that covers like, especially some of the uh, criticisms on the criticism end, it covers some really good stuff where I think he gets ridiculous and, and we'll get into that, but his proposal for what would happen for, for a better future. And, and I think he even knows it's ridiculous and, it, but he still says, no, 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 hear me out. And, and, and we'll just kind of keep pushing for it, but we'll, we'll get to that. But um, this whole concept of nomos, I'm not, I don't listen to it. I mean, I guess we could listen to it for a while here, but I, I don't know if I really want to, but did you go over the nomos and the pronomian and antinomia stuff? Um, gosh, I didn't get into this part. Let's listen to it just for oh, a no, second. I, I, I did. So this is, it's basically, if you know Peterson stuff, it's just order and chaos stuff. Yeah. The, right. the one, the one idea that I think is interesting about it is that these guys do put the laws within some sort of context of that. It should be maybe like a religious or societal, societally religious concept. They use this term nomos, which actually comes from the, um, <laughs> the, the uh, philosophies. I, I don't know if he's the original to do it, but he did a lot with Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt mm -hmm. was a Nazi philosopher, but a lot of people have tried to separate that part out to maintain some of his ideas. But one of the things they point to is that there's some societies that are pro-nomian, that are pro-laws and, and that sort of stuff. And then there's anti-nomian stuff. I'm, I'm going to go into it for a second because I think there is one kind of good explanation, explanatory thing in this. So. In the broadest cultural sense, saying that all men should take their hat off before the king is part of nomus. But so is saying that boys should wash their hands before supper. Saying that all good churchmen should observe the holy days of obligation is nomos, and so is the military draft. And here we come to a simple explanation of what is left and what is, by converse, right. The left is antinomian, the right is pronomian. If we look at human organization through history and human organizations generally, we see that each in turn are made up of promises and rules. One person, usually an authority, promises something to those who are lower, and in exchange, he is raised up in the hierarchy and is able to make the rules for the rest of society. This is a very basic model, but you will see it again and again in everything from the establishment of ancient civilizations and kings to corporate boardrooms. You also even see it in the case of religions and gods. It is no accident that the first religious testament that we have in the Bible concerns the development of a covenant, a promise made by God, and subsequently rules set out to govern the people in order that God can fulfill that promise, the core cultural element that binds a society together on a political and pre-political level. All right, so this might be an observation about how society is formed, but how does this play into our idea of reform and possibly the dissolution of institutions? Well, as we might expect with promises and rules, the social order of a society or really any institution can't remain static. Norms need to be modified to accommodate changes. There needs to be some flexibility and modification. Some rules need to be renegotiated or possibly even reneged on. Things change, but here comes a problem. When one makes a rule or a promise in turn, one limits possibilities and potential. Human operations are constrained. By breaking a rule, we are more liberated. We are free to make new commitments and to enjoy life in an unconstrained fashion. However, if we break promises and break faith with the rules that are made at any given time, the authority that is making those promises and making those rules loses credibility. The entire system is weakened and potentially even collapses. At some point, if we break too many rules, nothing works. And here, there is a trade-off that all civilizations need to make. How loose do we want to be with our own rules and promises? For want of an immediate analogy in the modern world, we could use the monetary system and the printing of promissory notes on paper currency. Issuing the initial currency is like an initial covenant with the people and their creditors. We print bills and then borrow those bills to buy what we need and what we think we can pay back in the future. However, as the people and the government go into debt, it finds it necessary to break or rather bend its promises in the printing of promissory notes by printing more and more money, inflating the currency, making it easier to pay its debts and in turn easier to borrow and spend money as it wants, worry-free. However, print too many promissory notes and people will lose faith with the currency. There'll be hyperinflation, an accelerating metastasizing collapse of the society and the ability of anyone to use money to negotiate for things that they need. For perhaps yet another simpler example, we might imagine the trade-off between pronomian and antinomian perspectives, the trade-off between strict rules and loose ones, being like the ant and the grasshopper from the famous Aesop's fables. The rule says work every day hard to store for the winter. Break the rule one day and you get a nice day off, a break in the ordinary pattern of existence and a chance to enjoy life. But break the rule every day as the grasshopper in the title of the fable and you will starve come winter. 
And so it goes with societies. The rules can be bent, but if they're broken, all hell breaks loose. Things fall apart, order breaks down, trust evaporates, and men cannot rely on their fellow men. And therein we can imagine, again, a balance, a pattern that takes place in most societies. The antinomian, bleeding heart grasshoppers telling society to make exceptions, to ease up, to let loose, to take a break from the promises and rules that define the society. The pronomian, fuddy-duddy ants sticking to order and the old ways and cautioning society that if it does ease up, that if it does slack from its duties, that if it does show too much mercy, the world will come to a bad end, society will starve come winter, and the barbarian hordes will be at the gates. But after everything, does this explain the progressive direction of history over the long term? Well, not really. If there was a trade-off like this, we would expect that our world would be simpler, that equilibrium would be reached, and that history itself would involve small cycles between these two forces, rather than a single direction. And this type of cyclical equilibrium might be the case if nothing changed. But of course, things do change. In particular, technology changes. Human beings do gain knowledge of the world over time, and we pass it on generation to generation. We do improve our understanding, increase our yields, improve our efficiencies, and generate larger margins and cushier boundaries between our families and the hardness of natural existence. And under these circumstances, the calls of the antinomians to loosen the rules and loosen the punishments and partially renege on our promises turn out more often than not to be vindicated. One can imagine a dialogue, hypothetically, between a right pronomian and a left antinomian. Pronomian. The law says work the earth from sunup to sundown. Antinomian. But with the newly invented plows and crop rotations, we need less work. Pronomian. Idle hands are the devil's plaything. Antinomian. Come, let us enjoy the fruits of our leisure time. I don't think it's hard to see what eventually wins. Technology and wealth come to liberate us from the regulations and structures we needed to maintain survival in a harsher world, in past worlds. The antinomian triumphs once more due to technology, the progressive obtains victory, and the path of history obtains its well-known leftward bias. And through technology and the loosening of norms, humanity is happier, or at least richer, and we return to the pursuit of our goals as people and as civilization with more ease. As technology accelerates, so does the left increase its own ability to become vindicated again and again in its antinomianism, in its tearing down of rules, customs, and in turn promises. We have finally come to accomplish our task, an explanation of the leftward force in history that explains both the simplicity of progressivism and the predictability and persistence of its victories. Mulberg's model seems to explain the nature of the left and also the predictability of history, the Hegelian idea that the processes of history are intelligibly moving to some kind of condition or outcome. Moving back to our timeline of conservatives, we can see that at every interval, what separates each conservative from the last, what makes Ben Shapiro more progressive than the early 20th century conservative, what makes the early 20th century conservative more progressive than his 19th century counterpart, is their relationship to the disestablishment of institutional norms, of their belief that certain rules should be done away with or relaxed, that the promises of the older society should be loosened. We have also, with some effort, been able to successfully explain the first two of Conquest's three laws of politics. Unlike, I may point out, both the contemporary liberal and conservative commenters, we see that people are more conservative about the things that they love because they're looking to preserve them. And we see the institutions, by their nature, become more progressive or liberal over time because they wind down and degenerate. So in recognizing that the leftward force of history is driven by humans' technological progress, how do we feel about it? Is not this entire process a good thing? Should we not be grateful for it? Is this not a victory over nature? A victory for humanity? A vindication of the concept of human progress? Well, perhaps, but perhaps not. This type of progress may be the ultimate salvation of humanity, but is there not a fly in the ointment, a critical flaw in the plan? In addition to simply progress or degeneration, whatever you prefer, there's another way of viewing the struggle between antinomian and pronomian forces, or the left and the right, and that is as a transfer. Originally, evolving and living in a harsh natural environment, human beings need norms, disciplines, and structures to ensure that they will survive. And this need for norms persists and perhaps even increases when the dangers of human organization move from being more natural to also involving war and other human rivalries on a large scale. In this sense, technological development acts as sort of a trade-off, replacing internalized human technologies of a disciplined rules and organization with external physical technologies that can offload some of the work. As we invent the lever and the pulley, the discipline put on our muscles can be loosened. As we invent inscription, writing, and stone tablets, we lose the discipline needed to memorize and carry on long oral traditions. Sometimes the technology replaces one discipline, such as memorization, with another, the disciplines involved in writing. Other times, as in the case of modern technological and information entertainment, the core human disciplines are eroded entirely, as modern man becomes increasingly atomized, sedentary, and isolated, losing his contact with both the land and also his fellow man. In this sense, the progress of technology and its subsequent progressivizing influence is a double-edged sword, increasing our wealth, but also eroding our humanity. Through progress and destruction of norms, we erode the rules, orders, disciplines, and promises that would otherwise allow our society to survive in harsher conditions. This is a fundamental decadence, and in Molbug's conception, technological innovation covers up the degeneration and social disorder that would otherwise be obvious. More fundamentally, in the progress of technology and antinomianism, there is no guarantee that 
the loosening of the rules and the destruction of promises is only going to impact superfluous institutions that are immediately obsoleted by the emergence of technology. As the victories of the antinomian left accrue again and again, as it is further vindicated by technology, the demand will accelerate. The activists on the left will begin to tear down more and more norms, more and more rules, until it begins to cut into living tissue, until it begins to destroy the social organization that society needs to go forward and generate the very technological advance that is needed to justify the leftward antinomian direction in politics to begin with. History does have a leftward direction, but there's no guarantee that it is going to be intelligent about it. Like an autoimmune disorder, the fixture begins attacking healthy tissue. And even- So and that gets to some, this work is really weird. I mean, that gets into some of their proper warnings. I think warnings that you and I totally agree with about technocracy, but that's again, where it gets a little bit into that hermeticism of um, <clears throat> that, not just their medicism that they they're going to figure it all out for us but like there's this concept that humans are weakening themselves for the sake of the technology kind of like we're creating a transhuman we're creating a god you know we're creating a god that and that god is not our best interest it's the best interest of that technology and that technology mm -hmm. has overtaken us and that's kind of how they view capitalism too that the capitalism overtook the humanity the machine is is we created the machine the machine's winning but i like the concept in there and I, I do agree with that concept because you always have the stuff where the you know leftists will say hey we're working towards progress we're going towards progress and we're mm -hmm. smart and we're the ones going the proper yeah. smart progress direction and th this is some interesting concepts and like no this isn't why you are actually entropy you aren't pro progress and entropy there's a fine right. line between <laughs> what you're talking about there and you yeah, don't even realize that, it that the only that progress is in the left direction which i've kind of always kind of looked at it as like no it's the straight and narrow path is what it is i think that you know i've kind of sat and thought about this and this is kind of something that peterson helped me think about just how much of a miracle it is that we have the ability to to get ourselves into a metal box whip it up to 80 miles an hour drive for 12 hours and make it down to to california and, and from here in salt lake and spend a week there going to the to the beach and and to disneyland and 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 you have a pretty high you have a very high confidence level that you're going to make it back in one piece a week from now you know i mean we take that for granted as as being so you know but it really is a miracle because of all the things that 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 go into making keeping the order enough See, we had to have enough, we had to have enough progress to be able to be able to learn how to refine metal, be able to make, make cars, refine oil, make rubber tires and gas and asphalt and all these things. And then not only that, but also be able to put into, uh, put rules into place to be able to keep it so that we, you know, don't just die because everybody else is driving too. But it's something that we take for granted often, I think it's, um, I think about it too, but it's like, it made me, Peterson kind of helped me to, to capture that and, and realize that you have to have just enough, you have to have just enough like creativity and, and chaos to be able to, to get us to where we're trying these, these dangerous things and, you know, fig figuring this stuff out, but we have to also have just enough order. What's that str and, and that's what the. You know, when you look at the yin and the yang, the Dao the Taoists have it have it kind of right that what they call the way is that line that straddles right between the white and the and the black, mm -hmm. and it would be the, kind of uh, the same thing as as the straight and narrow path. To me, that's to me that's where progress lies. But I mean, and I don't necessarily claim to be on the left or the right, but uh, that's that's me. Yeah. So. Uh... Let me try to get all these thoughts out because they're, they're not like one big thought. It's just like a bunch of different little thoughts that I have in the middle there. There's a concept of that, you know, nobody knows how to make a pencil anymore. Like say, go make a pencil. And you realize that you have to, you know, get all this lead from wherever that's sourced in, in Brazil and get this wood and get some sort of thing that can file it down. Where is that? Where is that rubber made? That rubber is made over in South Korea or something like that and then put it all together like nobody can make a pencil you know nowadays and that's a little bit of the warning of this technocracy but um there's there's a level of this stuff that I'm, I'm going to get into the Nick Land stuff a little bit which is it's extra weird but I, I don't want to like linger on it forever because maybe we'll do more on 
that whole entire McLaren stuff. We need to touch in on it, but that's where it kind of gets to where our last episode, we talked about the critical theorists and the critical theorists criticism of neoliberalism and the, the march of capitalism to, to make us all just suckered into our own, um, our own crappy, crappy capitalism, plastic bull, bull crap stuff. And th this is another area where I, I dislike them and I dis don't agree with them. I don't agree with even these Pomo right side people, because they both take the premise that say none of our experiences inside of that manipulative capitalism can be authentic experiences. And I just flatly agree with that. I think it's easy to disagree with that and say, no, you know, <laughs> there was plenty of real experience and real uh, soul and real heart and real connectivity and interaction and that stuff. And you guys don't just get to start from the premise of that was all fake. I'm just a great giant screw you no to that. <laughs> but then you can take the warnings of it, that there's something like we lose the ability to even know how to do the most basic of work to survive without the technology and, and all that mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. Or we get more and more alienated from having some sort of useful artisan task. And uh, the strange but, thing is that like, well, sorry, I, I'm totally derailing it. No, I just think that it's strange that we're being incentivized to, you know, that that's, what's kind of like the current zeitgeist is an incentivization to become completely useless. Yeah. I just think about the concept of a living wage for what, and that's the thing that's like the real danger out there is I think it is really dangerous to, you know, I mean, the things that taught me gave me confidence to, you know, Hey, if I got stranded out in the wilderness, you know what? I could survive. You know why? Cause I learned how to in boy scouts. Yeah. Boy scouts and Mormonism made sure that you held on to that stuff. And, yeah. and there, there's so much, these things, especially from the liberal point of view or side of stuff that most, both sides of the far left and the far right will kind of claim that we are powerless against the, uh, the sneaky maneuvers of the sneaky capitalists. As, I mean, they'll use the term capitalism and, and I think distributors has a really good video on the way they concept creep the term capitalism to mean all things evil too, which is just not true, but the distributors made a very good video on that, but they, they just say any sort of thing that starts tricking you into just being a, a lazy consumer is capitalism's fault. But I think there's far more on the individual, <laughs> there's far more on their own soul of saying, no, it's up to you to stay, to stay somebody who's able to defend themselves or to stay somebody mm -hmm. who's able to know how to survive in the wilderness or who's able to get off of social media. If you're getting old, if you're using it too much or be able to reconnect with family, you have to put in some exercise and it's not just the fault of the capitalism trying to pull that out of you. But the reason I jumped to the land right now, cause I, I don't want to go crazy long into it. We're going to do a little bit of them, but is that term accelerationism. And so there's this stuff in here that th these guys are kind of hopeless, like black peel that the technocracy is going to take over. I feel hopeless about it too sometimes, but so their answer came from it. And strangely enough, Nick land, who's considered maybe the, I think he wrote a book on the dark enlightenment or something like that called dark enlightenment. Oh, he's got another book called like fanged Numenon. He's got another one called like the meltdown or something like that. But he came out of the left. He came out of the critical theory left. And this is where I say that, that they have a, a whole lot of common in Pomo. And I'm going to point out to where Mencius Moldbug does too. But I, I also think anybody, anybody starting using those world, I mean, they're using them for your uses and, and criticisms and that sort of stuff. But I think it's, I think that is a rotten tree. You know, that that's my opinion. I don't care if you find it useful or whatever. <laughs> if you're using that stuff to start your arguments, I, I think you're, I, well, we'll get into, into it a little bit here, just real quick. Quite a few issues nowadays seem pretty much impossible to deal with. Whether at the individual or collective level, it's honestly hard to imagine a way out of inequality, pollution, human rights violations, and any other assortment of dread-inducing buzzwords. But maybe we just aren't being creative enough. In a 1967 sci-fi novel, Lord of Light, there's a group of revolutionaries way off in the future who want to take their society to the next level. They believe they can do so through swiftly altering the social attitudes people carry about technology. Instead of fear of the unknown, we should put our foot on the gas and see where it takes us. They call themselves accelerationists. Accelerationism is the real-world belief that technology and capitalism should be sped up. This is either because they genuinely think this is a good idea that will result in some sort of techno-capitalist utopia, or because there is simply no alternative. We can either prolong our suffering or go right through it. So, 
there, there's this right wing diving hard into the right capitalism and even diving into that same technocracy they're afraid of to push it through so it'll blow up faster. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, we can't beat it. So push it, push it through. Right. And, and I think I think that starting premise makes it almost kind of fake that you are like you're not a capitalist if your idea is capitalism so hard that you push the force safe capitalism and push it off the off the rails on purpose right well this is you, an you, you don't want to tend the garden you want to break it you know yeah and this is interesting because on the left you see a lot of these people who are are pushing so hard for like <clears throat> the materialist like transhumanism right so it's like yeah. like we're we're pushing toward technology and merging with with ai and all that kind of stuff on the left and this is where the right does it yep and it's exactly it's horseshoeing it's horseshoeing again although they would they'd all freak out and horseshoe i really am trying to steal man these guys a little bit but i'm gonna slip in my criticisms it's a horseshoe i actually think they're kind of the same people only these guys have thought about the arguments better hmm. does that make sense mm -hmm. you're the same these guys have thought about it harder same premises They've thought they've played those premises out a little bit more honestly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hence, they push for deregulation, the merging of the digital with the human, and the overall rejection of the belief that we can somehow control progress. Current accelerationist circles have even argued that the election of Trump, a hypercapitalist anti establishment figure, is the first true manifestation of their movement in politics. Where did this begin exactly? Many point to the mysterious philosopher and writer Nick Land as the source of the movement. Land was a young professor at Warwick, already known for his eccentricity, love of Nietzsche, and his propensity for climbing over chairs. He would tell his lecture audiences that he worked in the field of the collapse of Western civilization studies, and he would also get extremely high in his office. Reading everything he could get his hands on, Land quickly consumed all of Deleuze and Guattari's work, including Deleuze and Guattari. That's, that's mm -hmm. why I keep mentioning the people. Uh, they're kind of some people who, I don't know why, they kind of go s sneakily away from other people as, as postmodernists. When you have that Sokol squared, that Sokol, the original Sokol, um, the original Sokol scam in the 90s by Alan Sokol, where in that era, he was able to, he was able to write fake papers by just doing gibbity gibberish, right? James Lindsay and those guys, when they did Sokol squared, the later one, they tried to do some gibbery gibberish and it didn't work. They realized that they had to actually kind of have like some kind of fake point, like about like a uh, body, build. like it had to be coherently stupid. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? But the original Sokol project was just gibberish. Like I could just say gibberish crap and you guys are going to try to pull something out of it or think I said something real. He was making fun of, of Guattari. He was making fun of Deleuze and Guattari. Pro mm -hmm. probably most of all and Lacan the very ones that these guys especially like and uh, Zizek is right there with him he especially likes them probably especially likes them because they're just like so perfectly Hegelian and they're like bullcrap sentences that you could like if you're somebody there's so much of this stuff that I think you could pump through it and learn it real fast if you take it with a skeptic eye and you say what is this crap and you can just kind of pump through it but if you sit there and think that that sentence they wrote here and there actually means something you could read that sentence 50 million times as if it were Nostradamus, right? Mm -hmm. And try to pull some sort of crap out of it. And, and it's really just a bunch of crap. But Deleuze and Guattari had, a, they, they had two books they wrote together. I don't know why we always have to say both their names together because everybody pretty much agrees it was Deleuze who really did the work, did most of it. But uh, they had this book, Anti Oedipus, and then the follow up book called A Thousand Plateaus. And in that book is where they, they kind of, get into this, these ideas where these guys can, can come up with the concepts of thinking schizophrenically. So you can stop acting like anything needs to make sense or go in any sort of direction, do sorts of things. And then you can double down into capitalism. You can push through, we can accelerate, we can, we can do our thing, our bullcrap postmodernism through the capitalistic concept and, and just be kind of like oh, I don't, you know, complete and total hedonists inside of it. We can mm -hmm. go be Zizek and just push it through and make the thing accelerate its end, accelerate the the Marxist historicism, which is the concept that we're going to go through these stages and, and it's going to decay and it's going to break and then something good will come out of that. Right. And so these guys, I even call them the right, if you realize that the whole thing starts from Deleuze and Leotard's book, Libidinal Economy. I've talked to you about Libidinal Economy before. Remember that mm -hmm. one where, where yeah. that one has this, this stuff, this maybe doesn't pertain here, but I think it's might be like one of those Freudian. critiques. Yeah. Where he starts talking about, 
he starts saying that maybe your guys' homosexuality only comes from this thing that you're rebelling against, you know, mm -hmm. like maybe, maybe you say homosexual ex Mormons, your whole entire sexuality is wrapped up in the economy of that. There's some sort of capitalistic push for you to be that thing against that institution. And so he, Leotard came out later and said, well, I shouldn't have said that stuff, you know what I mean? But, um, <laughs> Uh, of course, some that you 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 hear that thought, and that sounds like a useful thought to right wing thinkers, right? Like, hey, your whole entire sexuality is only just your reaction to to, uh, yeah. to some oppressive system. It's not real. They went so you know? far left. They went right. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. who these guys are. Like, Absolutely. Like, like the hand of a clock. Yep. Horseshoe theory. But this is the starting point of the trad pomos. In anti oedipus as well as the work of Leotard. These thinkers emerged at a time when the leftist project appeared futile. In anti oedipus Katari and Deleuze wrote about the left's need to acknowledge the ability for capitalism to liberate and oppress. Rather I, I want to say something else, too, because uh, Sticks Hexenheimer had, had a video about this today, that the Libertarian Party is finally starting to come around because the Libertarian Party was crap for years. And mm -hmm. just like the third law of conquest, most people kind of think maybe that Libertarian Party was kind of just like a fake party ran by people who actually was were enemies to the Libertarian Party, mm -hmm. and they just kind of played like a perfect role. And uh, Sticks pointed out that the Amesis Caucus is winning and taking over Dave Smith and those guys. And you might be looking at a real Libertarian Party coming through the world. But Mencius Moldbug comes from the world of, it's almost kind of like these postmodernists realize their Marxism isn't working. Mencius Moldbug came from the world of, my Libertarianism is not working. <laughs> right? So... Mobug's the guy whose libertarian wasn't working, so let's accelerate. And Land is the one of my Marxism isn't working, so let's accelerate. So they're a little bit different, but the same. Right. Other than simply pose it at every turn. They suggest embracing the anarchic tendencies of the free market in order to go still further in the movement of the market to accelerate the process. Leopard would also write Libidinal Economy, which praised capitalism for its naturalness and that even its most oppressive aspects were enjoyed by its victims. Land was inspired by this thinking and began to form him philosophy. In 1992, he suggested that capitalism had never been fully unleashed and was always held back by politics, a practice he considered primitive, the last great sentimental indulgence of mankind. He began to form this idea of embracing the apocalypse through acceleration. Land saw capitalism as the motor of modernity, above and beyond any individual movement. This is strength. So by hyperstition, which is what he called the action of successful beliefs and ideas that, once emergent in the culture, give rise to their own reality through apocalyptic positive feedback loops. They are fictions that make themselves true. Capitalism is perhaps the greatest at this through more things that aren't actually essential. Capitalism, he adds, reduces the importance of the self. This was an idea that Land was quite comfortable with. As he argued, the individual has now become less important than the system they live within. The human experience is becoming increasingly irrelevant. This is evident in an early speech of Land's called Let's So, I mean, it is all Hegelianism, using the dialectic to just... Uh, so... It's it's different sides. Just like out of Hegel came the old Hegelians and the young Hegelians, out of postmodernism, and the end of the critical theorists of Adorno and Horkheimer, because these guys also like the sort Adorno and Hork Horkheimer a whole bunch. Um, they especially like the concept that Adorno and Horkheimer make it just true that all of your modernity, all of your liberalism, all of your all of your capitalism can't be real interaction. They just really like that it's all fake. It's all not true of the soul, but that serves a right-wing purpose because they want to say that it should kind of come through our religious ethno state. It's not always an ethno state, but or nat nation state or religious um, gathering sensibility. And so once you're reading it through that lens, you're going to, you're going to have real interaction and real family and real, and um, the leftist side of it's basically, unless it's going through the Marxist utopia, you're not having real interaction. And that's, once again, my just starting premise of F you. We've been having real interaction all along because we're actual humans, you you autistic AI robots. But um, <laughs> not not to really... I mean, I bet you some of them are autistic too, so I apologize. <laughs> Actually, but... Uh, like Elon. <laughs> well, you know, I bet you Nick Land is. I bet you Mencius Mulbug is to some extent. It's just some sort yeah. of sense, like if you li really read Mencius Mulbug, He's actually trying to read and take apart the entire situation like a system programmer would take it apart. Right. Right. But they actually do the thing that's been my question for Marxists all the time is that you guys are supposed to accelerate the contradictions. You guys are supposed to take criticism and incorporate them. But how come anytime we come at you with a criticism, you guys just go, shut up and, and try to censor us. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas a real supposedly dialectical person would, accelerate the contradictions they take that and incorporate it well these right. guys do that these guys actually do that you know mm -hmm. so kevin i i sent to him I'm, I'm gonna go through the whole entire thing 
but I sent to him this video that is Nick Land and like a bunch of different people. It's called, uh, this video is wild, man. <laughs> it is crazy. Four possible futures. And uh, this is kind of goes into like all their detail of like all the different ways that they predict the end of time can happen, right? You can see it and <laughs> I, I, I frequently said, like Joshua Slocum says, the leftist side is kind of like a group, a group version of histrionic disorder or, or mm -hmm. uh, narcissistic personality disorder. The, the right is kind of like a group movement of schizophrenia. <laughs> it's kind of pieced together all these sorts of things to kind of make this big giant thing that's happening to you, um, in secret uh, or not in secret, but right in front of your eyes. And, and you're, you got to watch out for all these different things, which is kind of funny because once again, Deleuze basically yeah. advocates for thinking like a schizophrenic and these guys kind of take yep. it like all the sorts of way. So these guys present four possible futures of the crazy future technocratic, whatever, and how they, it could all blow up in our faces. One rebuttal to it is, I don't think any of your possible futures are correct. <laughs> so that's one rebuttal you could take to it. But this is, this is an interesting video because even like the guy explaining all of them talks about some pushback ideas on each one of them. Well, it's interesting because, um, I mean, you, you watch this and it's sort of like the philosophical under, like, this is the underlayment of like, a lot of like the technical technological like when you watch some sci-fi movie and see what oh this is what the future is going to be like oh no it's going to be like this you know you can watch yeah. any sci-fi they're all going to have a little bit of a different take on on the future and this is kind of like goes through some of that stuff it seems it's like that too. but what's a little freaky about this is um so, so the problem with the whole left wing and the, the postmodernists, the reason we crack at them and James Lindsay cracks at them so hard and all, all of us do is because they have institutional power, major right. institutional power. You know, they, they really have overtaken the universities and then through the universities taken over all kind of mid-level institutions. These guys don't have that kind of power, but as usually happens in right wing thought and Mencius Moldbug is one of the ones to point this out a whole lot is that but then they do get true believers in powerful places. The the like thing though, two... to, the thing that makes me sweat a little bit is like, is there a sea change? Do you know what I mean? There's I mean, a sea change beyond like, that too. Like, you got Elon Musk. That's what I'm saying. Peter Thiel. But even so, if we're in like Dugan in in Russia, Alexander I mean, Dugan. This and he's kind of like sort of in this kind of camp, but it. over in Russia. He's in it. You know yeah, what I mean? It's the same type yeah. of stuff. Because he and definitely so, goes through those same uh, critical theories. He's a, he's a yeah. philosopher. So that's it's what I'm saying. He had like, Putin's ear at least for a time. The yeah. thing about it is, I mean, with the implosion of Twitter and stuff like that, you know, you're starting to see like a lot of stuff coming out, you know. And yeah, I think Elon Musk is a, is a Hegelian agent to, you know, of, of the right. <laughs> and Kevin's been onto that for years, <laughs> you know. He's been like, <laughs> I like Elon Musk seems cool, seems all that stuff. I don't trust them as far as I can throw. Yeah, no, <laughs> and, uh, I, I don't. I, I don't because it's, that's the thing is, it's like, well, what happens when he gets the ring of power, yeah. you know, and we may just be seeing that. Who knows? I don't know. I've said frequently like these, like I have my major problems with the left wing postmodernists, uh, ones who think they can change the world. We're going to, we're going to end up at the, uh, at a short fat of tacos video on utopianism, mm -hmm. but I hate them, especially because they got the most institutional power right now. And I really dislike them. And I dislike their utopianism, but I completely can imagine the world the same way. Like 20 years ago, I didn't know the mustard seed of all that stuff was going to grow into such a big pain in the butt. I could totally see this stuff being what I actually hate in 15, 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And it, having trampled the old, the other thing that's still going full blast every second of yep. every day too but i think there's some criticisms for it because like people like jordan peterson and james Lindsay will just almost cut these guys off and not even talk to them and not even hear them not even listen to them out i think that's a mistake i mean i think you gotta listen to them i think you gotta I talk to them i think any sort of the stuff you gotta take seriously and think about anything that you i've learned long ago that some of some sort of stuff like this just waving it off is bad idea and uh but beyond that like i said i definitely rank these guys I could see them becoming a bigger problem because they're more effective than the leftists, but some of their philosophy too, I still rank it above some of the leftists too. I still think they're, they are more in tune with reality. Like here, here's one of the concepts we were talking about last week that leftist Marxists kind of have this belief in capitalism. These guys like some of the Marxist critiques of capitalism, but I don't, but 
they have this weird conspiracy theory about it that from the original intent of it, it was this control method. These guys have the more realistic view of it is that it came about naturally because things like that come about naturally. <laughs> and then through natural things, you can see the ways they're useful and start using them in that way, which is obviously more intelligent than the the weird conspiracy theory that, yeah. that you know, and you can, you can see that sort of understanding of nature playing a role in how things go. And they, they even have a strong belief, maybe even too strong, that, that uh, the whole entire leftist super movement, which they absolutely see and are honest about, but they think like, it doesn't have to have any top actors in it. Like it can just naturally evolve into that sort of thing. And that's just how it happens, which I think is true too. But I think at some point people start realizing how it's useful and then start actively using the thing in that useful way. It doesn't just stay completely organic. I mean, stuff definitely starts getting used after you see how useful it is. But the Marxist concept of that's just ridiculous. But so I'm going to show this. There, there's this David Lynch has this little crappy, not crappy. There's some good stuff in it called love, sex and robots and Netflix. It's an interesting show, but they keep showing this stupid, it's a recurring thing. Cause there've been three seasons. This is a little episode that keeps recurring and it's these three robots that kind of go around examining the end of, of humanity. Back to where it started. If you remember the, the first season, it featured three droids who were out exploring a post-apocalyptic world where the human race had gone extinct. It offered a great outsider's perspective as they viewed everything through their robotic, rational lenses. That is incorrect. One million percent incorrect. And it's and it's one of my main critiques of leftist thinking is if you watch these videos, I, I recommend watching them because their other ones are good too. They kind of have just like some weird kind of Lovecraftian stories and they're all short. They're like eight minute little short videos. But the concept that they think that these robots are rational, the concept <laughs> that they think that these robots aren't just regurgitating their idealism is the whole entire problem with the left. Is It's the, it's my problem with the Lynn and Lars and all sorts of those guys. Is they think that these robots, the stuff that they say, which is all obviously lefty. Mm -hmm. It's all obviously lefty lefty presumptions and diagnoses of what happens in the human. Right. Obviously. But the whole entire premise of this thing is that we are super scientific, super objective, super robots. Lefty idea, lefty idea, lefty idea, lefty idea, lefty shaming, lefty shaking, shaking our heads at how dumb the humans were. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's, <laughs> yeah. And it becomes, <laughs> to me, it's, it's, it's one of the areas you should be able to see, one of the best areas you should be able to see the way the left views themselves as wholly objective and just are not. Because this is them trying to present completely objective robots who are the farthest things from objective that you'll ever come across. <laughs> I recommend watching every single one of these videos and uh, watch it and say, the lefties who wrote this think these robots are pure objectivity. So that's some homework right there, but that's just going <laughs> along more with them. Um, so the eschatology of all these guys, they, they all kind of start pushing towards an eschatology. And this one of the sort of things that's funny about it is when I left Mormonism and became a, a atheist, agnostic, whatever. One of the things that I thought I escaped was eschatology. You know what I mean? I thought we were done with en end of times, coming of Christ, coming of all that sorts of stuff. And <laughs> that's another one of those things that nope, nobody escaped it. Nobody's, we're all doing mm -hmm. the same apocalyptic yeah. thinking at all times, everywhere and all things. But Yarvin, Yarvin, just to say another one, he's, he did some of his stuff in that open letter to an open-minded progressive. So long ago, he did a lot of really good stuff on pointing out about the kind of, he calls it the cathedral and pointing out how the new lefty academic Dawkins type stuff is just, he, he, he makes a very strong case using very good references that it's just the next step of Calvinism. It's just the next step of Puritanism. And I've made that so, some sort of arguments of ex-Mormonism too. Some people don't like it, but I think it's just absolutely true. I, I just think they it, it, it turns into a type of, of a successor religion. It's a successor religion. Wesley Yang calls the whole ideology successor ideology. Um, but it is just the next version of something. And he's got he, real... When was he coming out saying that? Like 2008. Or... In like yeah. 2008, he was pointing out, so he pointed out, 
really, really kind of thoroughly. I could understand it's where impressive. He, he might get a little bit like, because Peterson gets credited for blowing the lid off a lot. Like, yeah, and you it, can see where they in, get a little frustrated the that as a mainstream thing, though. You can see he gets they get a little frustrated that they blow it out. But the these show. guys are too. But there, it seems like they're being a little bit too. I don't know. You look at Yarvin. He's he was a tech entrepreneur, Silicon Valley tech guy. I think that a lot of them are are obsessed with this idea of being the Gnostics. I'm the one yeah. with the. Well, I'm the one who thought it first. I'm the one yeah. who said it first. Exactly. I got canceled first. You know, it's like this. me, me and Hermione Granger and and Ron. We're we're the three that that have the Horcruxes, and nobody else. Everybody else is you know. We're, well, we're the three chosen, you know. I also want to talk about this too, because like if you're in Mormonism your whole life, if you grow up your whole life in Mormonism as I did, as you did, as John Larson and John DeLynn did, mm -hmm. there's a, there's an aspect of it that we were in the dang shire and we didn't realize we were in the dang shire. And part of being in the dang shire was we did not follow very well what was going on out in the world of, of yeah, bigger, larger true. politics. And we also didn't know what sort of a, kings i'd already sold their souls for all the all the money in the world and had become you know dark riders we had no idea the striders who were protecting us and all that sorts of stuff and so like we, we kind of break out into this larger you know world of politics and there's a level of me that like so so every single person who's leaving mormonism that we suddenly get thrown in the world of politics and politics become your religion whether you like it or not it just starts happening and I, I wish you wouldn't, but it doesn't. And I'm not saying it's 100 percent everybody else, because some people do just kind of go, go enjoy their life or stay in a shire in some sort of way. But if you go out of the shire, you realize that you have to be at a moment, as I am now, even reading and learning about these guys, that you're at a point of like, I don't know what your arguments are. So tell me what your arguments are. And you and I have absolutely come to some of those same ideas that Yarvin has about the the academic religion type stuff and, and all that mm -hmm. sorts of deals. And we came to some a lot of those ideas separately on our own as well. But then if we go say it, and some of them I said before I ever read Yarvin, but then if we go say it, well, Yarvin already said that, <laughs> you know what I mean? I bet you other people said it before Yarvin too, but. Yeah, but he saw it coming way before we did. Yeah, and he, he labeled, not only did he see it coming, he labeled it out really well. And people, a lot of people, you'll hear Michael Malice. I think that Eric July will use the concept of the cathedral a whole lot. They like the mm -hmm. term the cathedral. Um, Sargon of Akkad uses the concept of the cathedral, just calling the mixture of academia, the media, and the democratic politics is the cathedral. Right. And I think, but he, he did so much more to label it out. He goes into a lot of detail and he pointed out at the time when, when those new atheists were really huge, he started pointing out how they were already pulling off some things that really looked a whole lot like religion. And he has some really good critiques on that. Not all of them I'll be able to remember right now, but maybe I'll bring them up again when we, when we talk more about this. But there's this idea that I wanted to point to first about something to understand about this right-wing postmodernism. And it comes from iDubbs. <laughs> it wasn't from iDubbs. iDubbs recently did a documentary on Sam Hyde. A lot of people might know who Sam Hyde is. Sam Hyde is a comedian. I think he's a funny comedian, actually, but he's a really weird comedian. He's hard to follow. One of the funniest things you'll ever watch is somehow he broke into a TED Talk and gave a whole crap, bull crap <laughs> TED Talk at a real <laughs> TED Talk conference. Mm -hmm. And you got to listen to it just to hear how stupid it is. But at the same time, nowadays, if you listen to Scribe Light, the, the channel, you realize that most TED Talks are just as stupid nowadays, even if they're, they're dead honest. So one of the things about Sam Hyde, he had this whole uh, TV show on Adult Swim called Million Dollar Extreme. The thing got shut down and some of the people who got it shut down were Tim and Eric. And it's because they thought that he was being too conservative-ish in his or right wing seeming or even to the point that they thought he was ethno-state conservative. And, mm. Ultra but, maggot. One of the things about him is, yeah, so anytime you might have heard the meme a whole lot, it comes from 4chan, but anytime there's a mass shooter, there's something gets spread around and news articles pick it up that they say Sam Hyde was the shooter. And mm. every single time that happens, some they get some news article, they get some news place to start saying Sam Hyde. Was so just shooter. a big troll? It's a big troll. It happens again and again and again. They get real news stations to do it. But one of the funnier ones you could have seen recently is they news stations were reporting on after the Ukraine war broke out, mm -hmm. news stations are reporting on um, the uh, special like flight person who bombed a bunch of Russians and killed them, Sam Hyde. <laughs> and they were really reporting. And they had like these pictures of Sam Hyde in a fighter jet and all that sort of stuff. And they got news stations to really report that because 
a lot of the joke is that our news stations are absolute crap at vetting things nowadays. But yeah. there's you can look up in a whole huge history of get news stations getting reporting that Sam Hyde was the shooter and all that yeah. sorts of stuff. So he does a lot of internet trolley stuff. And then his million dollar extreme stuff was funny too. But, he, you know, he's always been on about stuff. But there is some sort of level of this thing called, well, I'll let iDubbbz explain it here. But think about the Pomo trads when you listen to this explanation that iDubbbz gives here. Here we go. Take it away, iDubbbz. iDubbbz just recently was the guy who was, these guys had drama just like two weeks ago. They iDubbbz had a boxing match and they started doing these YouTube content creator boxing matches. And the guy from Epic Meal Times, Sam Hyde trained him as a boxer to go fight in this thing. But then iDubbbz, after, even after all this stuff, supposedly blocked Sam Hyde from coming to the live match and watching it live. There's a bunch of trolling back and forth because iDubbbz went to his house to do this long documentary on him. iDubbbz is the guy, he was content cop. He's got a lot of good material where for years he just covered other YouTubers and the crap that they do or not do, you know? So he's a YouTube famous for covering other YouTubers. Does that make sense? So he went and did a documentary on, on Sam Hyde. And when he got to the Sam Hyde's place, there was all this, and iDubbbz is smart enough. He's internet savvy enough. He's well enough aware with it that he knew he couldn't trust Sam Hyde. And so he gets to Sam Hyde's place and he doesn't know if anything he's seeing or doing or, or having going on there is real. And that's just true with Sam Hyde. You have, nobody knows who Sam Hyde really is. So he tries to give an explanation of this here. But keep in mind the Pomo trad stuff in this. It, there, it, Sam Hyde is totally Andy Kaufman. He's Andy Kaufman, totally, right? I understand about the war. So with the context that Sam openly aligns himself with the alt-right and white supremacy and misogynistic stuff, uh, it's hard to write off any of the ironic stuff as just ironic. Peace. Because hate is black, dude. My race is done. You're inheriting here, along with some other undesirables. And that's cool, bro. Hi. Before we continue with the documentary, I want to take a few minutes to talk about irony. I wish there was a perfect way to explain to you guys why talking to Sam Hyde is frustrating. Not only to a person making a documentary about him, but as a guy who doesn't actually know Sam on a personal level. A lot of people probably refer to irony as having metaphorical layers, but irony exists in a circle. This is the circle of irony. At the top of the circle of irony, you have sincerity. You can't have any amount of irony without some sincerity. There's some sort of levels to not not to call it because there's some sort of thing of like if you're explaining a joke, you're giving away a joke. Yeah. But uh, you might think of Quaker a little bit when you're listening to this stuff. Mm. <laughs> Behind it. Here's an example of a sincere thought. I don't like eating shit. People who are not being ironic say sincere things like that all the time. You might say that it's the default way to say things. The next rung on the circle of irony is just called irony. You might be familiar with this from English class, and it basically means that you kind of feel the opposite of what is being expressed. Uh, and it's basically just sarcasm. Oh yeah, I love eating shit. Great, people think I love eating shit now. Isn't that just perfect? This is the go-to boomer humor that old people thrive off of. They love sarcasm. It is a basic level of irony to the point where it's almost irrelevant to millennials and Zoomers. After irony, we have post-irony. This is where you say something in a way that makes it sound like you don't mean it when you actually do mean it. In other words, you're using irony to make a joke about how you're joking. Oh, I don't, I don't like eating shit. Oh, me? Oh, no, I don't like eating shit. I hate that. I don't like eating shit. I don't like eating delicious, creamy shit. Stop saying that about me. If you put a pile of shit in front of me, I wouldn't devour it like an animal instantly. I wouldn't be doing that. This is probably the most popular form of irony in the modern generation. They're basically parodies of memes. So you have to already know what irony is to appreciate or begin to appreciate post-ironic humor. And look, there's no more room on the circle, so we must be done. What the is that? Me Irony is where this gets fucked. This is where you're saying something sincere, but the context could imply that you're saying it ironically, yet the thing that you're saying is actually a sincere thought. If this doesn't make sense, that's because it doesn't make any sense. It's meant to confuse you. Meta-irony is placed intentionally in the circle in a way that doesn't make any sense because it is intertwined with sincerity. No, I don't like eating shit. No, I don't like eating shit. Unless. <laughs> but do I like eating shit? You don't know, do you? The fact that I brought it up in the first this place is a little bit suspicious, but the concept of eating shit is so ridiculous that I have to be serious when I say I don't want to, right? Meta-irony is used effectively by people whose intention is to blur the line between sincerity and jokes. It creates a situation where in order for there to be a prerequisite of sincerity, I have to obtain the knowledge outside of the joke. You're basically just saying the consumption of shit is something that is physically possible. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> I'm retarded. But if you're not saying anything about something when you say it, why do you even say it? People don't tend to do things for no reason. There has to be an answer here. And there are two answers. Either you're just bad at irony, or you're just being sincere. This is why it's so difficult to be around Sam. Try to understand him and ultimately make a documentary about him. He lives here. Sam is drenched in meta-irony constantly. 
he intentionally doesn't make it obvious when he is or isn't joking about something. Why he does this is up for interpretation, I guess, but after seeing how much he appears to involve himself in political ideologies, it seems he prefers to use meta-irony as a shield. To say, I was just joking, is a legitimate way to exonerate yourself in moments of actual miscommunication. But it's also a perfect fallback option for when you receive criticism for a point that you're genuinely trying to make. I think eating shit is awesome. What the fuck? You like eating shit? I was just kidding. Are you stupid or something? Well, now I feel bad for being unaware of any irony going on, so in the future, I will not criticize you for anything you say. I am now invulnerable to criticism. So he's obviously not a fan of that, but there's truth in, in his description there, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you're dealing with these Pomo trads, you are, there's some level that you are dealing with that. Even Nick Land, even, especially because you know he's starting from like a leftist uh, viewpoint, but even with the Arvin and the people who start following it and the people who start doing it, um, I'll, I'll show real quick right out of uh, the mouth a little bit of Yarvin this week, just this past week on uh, he was he did an interview with uh, Benjamin Boy. Let's listen to that. That's Curtis Yarvin. If you want to think in a way that would lead, if you can get other people to think in this way, real things to happen, there's something actually more exciting about that. And it's exciting in a like subtle and ironic way. The idea that the way to have real power is to like give up your power has this ironic quality to it. And the thing is that we are living, we have the most ironic population history. There's never been any period in history when like irony was as mass market. The memes are a flowing, my friend. Never anywhere close. And so basically- How is sense, irony a political force? Like I've heard you bring this up, but what is irony it Irony is a it? political it force because it basically allows you to like say like fit in a really interesting way. There's but none of the, the aesthetic show, like you know that No, not in, do, do you know the British show Black Mirror? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. If you, there's, a, uh, there's a Black Mirror episode I always point people to where um, the population elects a cartoon character as a joke or as a like comment or as a something, right? Yeah. You know, and it's like, or if you look at something like sort of storm area 51 that didn't come off, area 51 wasn't stormed, oh, yeah, but yeah, it yeah. kind of gives you a sense of like that, the sense of like, there will be, whenever this thing comes crashing down, there will be like a ludic, a playful sense to it. Much as there was like, especially in like Czechoslovakia in 89 with like the, the velvet revolution, you know, um, you had this real sense of playfulness to it. Like an important aspect of the, uh, of the velvet revolution was this like, um, sort of a band plastic people of the universe it was kind of velvet underground influence okay. like you know and so you had your Václav Havel who's this like ironic playwright becomes the you know mm -hmm. goes from being a dissident to the president of Czechoslovakia um we and, saw a little bit of that in the trucker uh convoy yeah, in Canada. Yeah. There, there was a there's communal a thing of, but the weird thing about that was thing. that that's where was, Trudeau like showed the power of the state to yeah, strip people and, of their and, finances which is really scary and like, people took it like yeah and people took it like way too like seriously in a way and his his, his uh, move to no the, 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 no the truckers the, the truckers took themselves way too seriously okay. and sort of not seriously enough like they didn't like yeah. Like, like there was, yeah, I mean, they were, they were kind of LARPing in the end. They weren't like, it, wasn't you, it sounds like you're, you're advocating for LARPing, but there's like some sort of truth, sincerity, this really yeah, sharp you know, there's, side. There's like, there's like, you sort of do it as a LARP, but it becomes real. It's like basically the sense of being a sort of a joke that makes itself real, I think will be kind of part of hmm. this thing. That sounds it kind of like, like apocalyptic or revelatory. Well, it's in, in a way, I mean, I mean, we talked about Ukraine, Ukraine elected a comedian as president, right? You know, and so there's yes. this sense of like, it will feel sort of almost accidental. It won't have this sort of like patriots rise up to like, you know, feeling it won't, it will be like, we can't take this seriously. Anymore, like a carnival. Right? Yeah, it will have a, it will have a very joyous feel and not a very, like a carnival. It will feel very joyous and it will not feel like, and it it's will feel sort of that image, and irreversible. Coupled and, with the outcome of like somebody with absolute power completely just liquidating all the institutions and rebooting them, yeah. which is like the most serious thing. I mean, it, yeah. it's comedic. Like, like I read, yeah, I've been exactly. reading your Substack. We get to the part where, like, well, how are we going to change things? And it's so out. It's just so absurd. It's like we're just going to tear everything apart. We're going to take complete authority. It's like what? He can't do yeah, that. Like, and, it, and, it and breaks my brain every time. I, right. And and, yeah. and and that the sense of basically like voting for that or voting to be like you know, it's like you know, one of the ways I sort of picture it is, is I'm like, imagine you're in like the little room with the astronaut at like the end of 2001, right? And you're just in this yeah. like weird space and like right, there's Dave. like land food, all right, Dave, right? You know, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that. You know, and, and like, but there's one difference. There's a red button on the wall and under the red button, it says, if you press this button, everything will change. Well, serious, sober, like hardworking, respectable people are not going to, grownups are not going to press that button because they're like, we could just be shot into, out into space. That would be a change. But, you know, who presses the button is basically immature people, childlike people, like people who are, have a sense of fun, which is much bigger than their sense of seriousness. And so, you know, 
the people of America today are not Minutemen. They are not like the like Paul Revere is not in the building. Like they do not act out of like a deep. You know, sense a, of have you seen sincerity. every couple months? Like there's this really stupid group of like supposed white supremacists, but it's totally an FBI sting. It's like there's just footage of them. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like they're the yeah, people's army or something. Yeah, yeah, and everybody's yeah. laughing at them. Nobody believes that that actually right. is serious. Right. And 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 so the sense of like, uh, you know, that sense of like really deep comedy and irony like that's so ironic that it's real mm. is like really crucial to that sort of spirit to how like did you get this idea any possible regime change how did you come to this conception uh, um i think that it's sort of part of kind of being brought up in the american upper class and kind of understanding it's like spirit <clears throat> in a way in it sounds like you need um, so he's kind of saying the only way that Klaus Schwab's going to be able to 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 do this is if he dresses up like a clown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so no, I will I will answer that for him because he was I'm not going to say it there, but in some of his writings he does sort of answer it. Is that his claim is ultimately that the right? Hey kids, it's time for the great reset. <laughs> oh gosh. <that's> <laughs> So Klaus Schwab's on the left. He's he's part of the repressive tolerance world. You know, we just saw this week that Ethan Klein from Easter Easter. He, I guess he did finally get a strike on it, but it took him a couple of days. He was able to say go bomb the NRA lobby yeah. and all that stuff, and he didn't. Oh, have and any then sort I of... must I got to roll that back. You know. Yeah. Very, very, very sincere. He's been very honest and forthright about not honest forthright, just uh, good at documenting. That throughout history, it's not just recent, that repressive tolerance thing is throughout history viewed that way, that any sort of right wing reaction or activism is viewed as horrid violence and any left wing horrid violence is viewed as speech, right? So he came to this concept of all this stuff is that you got to put this sort of level of irony to it and then it will take some of that... Uh, that sting out of it if that makes any sense but the problem is is that's even how he says to take your religion fake it till you make it type stuff and like a little bit like i said how i think distributist the next atheist is taking on the catholicism in a bit of a fake it till you make it type sense but if you really think about it on some level the midnight mormons take that that idea to to extreme too is that we're going to come at this from a trickster jokester point of view and, and even mm -hmm. jordan peterson pointed that as a good idea for you know a way to push back you know because uh, what do you always say from Jung that the trickster precedes the yeah. how do you say it the fool precedes the king or something like that something like that but the the ultimate idea behind it is that anything done too seriously by the right wing well, even the stuff that's done jokingly gets demonized, but they're just saying like, you're in such a world that you don't realize that you've been behind a hundred years of left-wing hegemony and you don't even realize it, that you do not know you'll be squashed. And why can Antifa act like a bunch of nutcases and the right wing can't? Because any sort of protest, the only protesting that can happen is what's allowed by right. the, uh, the allowers, you know what I mean? By the cathedral. By the cathedral, right another so the reason i brought that up is just saying two levels one level is take it with a grain of salt a lot that they claim to believe any of this stuff but also believe it because they actually mean it but the, they'll also take it with a grain of salt it's a little bit like whenever quaco talks about uh lizard people <laughs> uh, he's he doesn't believe it but he believes he? it <laughs> you know but yeah. he doesn't believe it but does he it, you know and any of that sorts of stuff but then there's a second level too of like, if you're a sincere person, like a, a person who's truly being sincere or like a true honest believer or a true honest Christian or a true honest Mormon or that sorts of stuff, like uh, why is that such a trustworthy angle to take? And, and me, myself, I mean, I'm somebody who's trying to be, trying to get into stuff, try to re-examine different religions, try to re-examine who's allies and that sorts of stuff. I would not put it on my plate to come f to fake it till I make it with anybody. Like it, if, if I'm going to be a part of the thing, I'm going to be a part of the thing or be as part with it as, as honestly as I can be. I would be suspicious of anybody um, taking well, that kind angle of or something because they might be using you for a means to their end. Right. And that's, I think, maybe an inch and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it, that's sort of like the Calvinist approach to Christianity a little bit, right? I mean, it's almost like, hey, look... <laughs> I'm a, yeah. I'm, I'm a sinner by nature. You know what I mean? 
Like, oh yeah, it's don't, totally. Don't, and they don't trust me completely. Like for sure. And they totally pulled Ka- the ideas from Calvin I, into the whole entire thing. Yeah, which I which I I kind of agree with that. You know what I mean? I, I mean, didn't. I didn't find the exact clip, but I'm not going to play the clip. But this is just uh, Jared again from uh, Cracked. He was on with Kerry Smith again uh, this mm. week. But he had a couple good points. One of them, one of them was he was talking a bit about like the capitalism thing about how like the he works for a games company now, that, and that games company is ahead of you on knowing what you like, and they can learn so much from you from all the different apps and stuff. And that's that's one of these right wing warnings, and it's a left wing warnings of these tech things kind of get maximizing the capitalism out of you because they're able to right. just yep. see right past your soul and get you to act and do stuff in a different way. And, and it is one of those criticisms that makes um, some sense. But he also made a point in this that on the left wing and the right wing, when you're dealing with the theorists, the people who are just the theorists, they're not actually in the street anywhere. They all probably own houses. You know, Yarvin owns a house, Judith Butler owns a house, right? <laughs> There, there's some sort of level that you got to stop and think that that some of these people are just kind of like saying the most wackadoodle thing they can because they're kind of academically showing off. Patrice Coulor um, owns six houses, so yeah, yeah, but on the, the <laughs> but that's not that's not an academic. Yeah. So he his point was like well, these different was, people who she... are seemingly extremely smart who come up with these big wild wacky things. Sometimes you got to realize that like really. The main thing they're doing, like Yarvin can talk about the right wing being just an underdog for forever and forever and forever and forever. But we also know that I've seen him. I can not pull clips right now, but I know I could pull clips that like when it came to the vaccine, he just dives right in. He, he, he writes about like how climate change is, is used by the left wing as a club. But when it comes to actual climate change, he, change, he just dives right in. <laughs> like he still acts kind of like a. Is he, he a libertarian? Meta ironically. You know? Yeah, but it's meta ironically, all this sort of stuff, or a lot of these different concepts or ideas are like, look, I can go down this rabbit hole of this way of thinking, but do I really think it, you know, I'm just kind of showing mm-hmm. off that I can take these ideas to their, to their ends, you know, and Jared made a good point about that on that, on that episode. It's a good episode to listen to anyway, because Jared's always good because he's kind of like an ex lefty along with Carrie and he'd been in LA for years going through that stuff. So I'm not going to go through a ton of this either just to show it. This is a Keith Woods. Keith Woods is one of the dudes who covers a lot of stuff. He's a right-wing dissident guy. I wouldn't say he's exactly a pomo tribe, but he absolutely uses critical theory and all that sorts of stuff to talk about it. But he, he actually has some videos that kind of separate out what the, all the different ideas and things are in, in the dissident right, as you may call it, although he calls dissident right as specific people. But he's got this long video here on Alexander Dugan. And just like you said, I don't think we have to go into it in great detail. A lot of because these guys are on the right, they'll say there's some differences in Dugan and these other guys. And I think if you listen to the whole thing, you realize, I uh, know those differences are very trivial. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty much the mm-hmm. same thing. There's some ideas that there has to do with like Eurasianism and, um, you know, th- some different ideas about how to conquer the world from, from that geopolitical angle you know, which might be extra stuff in it. But the whole idea of going through postmodernism, going all the way through to something new that's kind of pre-modern, but it's a maybe a techie pre-modern, postmodern, pre-modern thing, and being pro-ethno state, but then saying we're going to be good ethno state, and we're finally getting to the weirdest idea of Yarbins, which is the big, big kind of showstopper, which maybe we've been hiding the ball on it, is that they ultimately use... Use the use the writings and the concepts of Julius Ebola, who is another philosopher, to say, "Hey, all that fascism in back in the 1930s, that wasn't true fascism. <laughs> <laughs> we can do dictatorship right, yeah. and yeah. we can do ethno state right." So we've been hiding, we've been uh, we've been burying the lead on that one <laughs> a little bit. Right. Um, I don't, I don't think. Uh, I mean, they're realists. They're realists about ethno states. Some of them are worse than others. Like Nick Land and Alexander Dugan are going to be like, yes, we should absolutely separate into ethno states. Mm-hmm. Yarvin's not going to push that, but he's going to. He'll be a realist about stats or something like that when he's when he's reviewing things. But they ultimately push into this whole kind of general concept of um, you got to be real that we. That nation states, ethno states, the one of the ways we gel, and one of the ways we gel together, these these materialists, and they call both the liberals and the Marxists full materialists. 
So we'll both have the problems. In fact, Alexander Dugans almost doesn't even separate them both because he thinks the liberalism just leads to the post-liberalism to the Marxism or whatever. Right. That no matter what, you guys, because you start from a materialist, atheistic standpoint, you can never have the gelling that we we can possibly have. But I think they run into problems with that when half of what they're saying that we need to gel into is our new imagined um, postmodern religion that we can fake right. it until we believe it type stuff. Because they can't come to an agreement about which religion should we all circle around. Mm-hmm. Um, they use perennialism a little bit. Perennialism is the idea that all, kind of all religions are a little bit the same. It goes back to almost kind of Neoplatonism that there's this there's this being out there that is the one or something like that. And all the religions are kind of like hinting at getting towards that. So it doesn't really matter which one we choose because uh, they're all kind of the same ish, but they can't really, uh, obviously supposedly the thing that will gel them together. We all know will be something that they would fight about if they really got to be um, in charge. Once again, all these ideas are, we accelerate the blow up that these idiot liberals and Marxists are going to do with the technocracy and then post the blow up, post the destruction, we can go about creating our, what Yarvin calls formalism, which is basically pre-modern monarchy. That's the pitch. Mm-hmm. You down with that? No. Why not? It's pretty good to me. <laughs> uh, of course, they're galaxy brains, so they think it all out and talk about why well, it will be better this time or something like that. His ultimate pitch, this this is this is the weird thing about it. Is we didn't I do think, monarchy right before. We can do it right now. Yeah. Well, so so Yarvin kind of makes this whole pitch that if like if you imagine some being that we made God on a separate planet, he calls them like Splurgblot or something like that. And that that God, that that kings the only stuff that that king was after was useful to him like get some gold for him or something obviously all of his desires would be in line with the same desires of what the people's desires are so you wouldn't ever have a problem that sort of stuff and you know like one of the things i heard say about it is like why would that guy ever think about you smoking a J? he wouldn't care and i kind of go wait a minute like yeah like that guy could absolutely, for the same reason, our oligarchical thing, and that's another thing these guys, they say liberalism always turns into an oligarchy. Mm-hmm. But the same reason our oligarchs thought weed was trouble, some some king, some unattached king could also find out it was trouble too because it was bringing about a little less gold. I mean, that doesn't follow at all, you know? But um, I think what's funny about it is like, if you listen to his whole description, he kind of talks about it of like the interests of that King, the the full interests of that King will always be kind of fall in line. The same as the interests of those, those people, like, like a CEO, a CEO wants good for his Mm -hmm. his employees. It'll just happen that way. Just stop questioning very much. It'll just happen that way. If you really think about it, CEO who wants to stay on top who wants to keep afloat, who wants to. And that's kind of the way he, he takes it. It's not like this, like, uh, I mean, I, I mean, rather than just like, we're going back to like feudalist king, king type of monarchy. It's like, he kind of more views it like a CEO. Yeah. And uh, I'll use the same uh, criticism I had earlier that I said that like, I listened to your whole entire idea and your longer pitch of what that king or CEO would be like. And once again, I think you came across a system that would work if that was Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yep. Way to go. You did it. You came across another <laughs> system that would work if that was Jesus. If Jesus top. was running it. Yeah. I could find a lot of systems that would probably, I bet you the Marxism would work if Jesus was the, was the Orwell pig or, uh, I could, uh, make liberalism not rust at all. If, if Jesus was the, uh, but we're winding down. I can't believe we're actually getting there. There's so much to, do. I'm just going to show these, a couple of these, uh, videos. Sargon's been covering it lately. Uh, he's got, He's got this guy on his on his channel uh, called Callum. You know, I like him well enough. He's he's interesting well enough. He's got this whole series called Critical Based Theory. Mm-hmm. So, so one of the things about this stuff, and, and I never really like it if people kind of hide the ball. I think he hides the ball a little bit, although he's slowly releasing it out. But I'm just going to say it plainly. He's a dark enlightenment guy. That's all there is to it. You know, Sargon isn't quite 
all the way there, but he Sargon likes a lot of these ideas because as the years mm-hmm. go on, Sargon from his classical liberal idea and from reading a lot of these different ideas and reading Locke and all sorts of people, it keeps landing on very, very conservative ideas. But then Sargon still holds on to his atheism, all sorts of stuff. So Sargon's almost kind of like full conservative Christian atheist of England, Church of England atheist, you know. And but he still just holds on to classical liberalism ultimately. But on his channel, he's got a full dark enlightenment guy here. The reason it's called critical base theory is because he can use all of the same. He make he kind of makes the argument through this whole series that he can use all those same Adornos and Horkheimers and all that sorts of stuff to ultimately attack the left and neoliberalism, right? Right. And he's even kind of been critical of Lindsay here and there and he tries to he tries to save the criticisms of marxism and and doesn't like when Lindsay equates critical race theory to marxism which i absolutely agree with Lindsay 100 mm-hmm. percent with that it's just i i do not give a crap if i do not if there's if both calvinists and whatever other protestant you know are christians both critical race theory and and adorno are marxists i'm sorry yeah. That's all there is to it. But I still think it's a good series. It's interesting enough. He he has this video here that does a fairly good job of explaining because everybody kind of gets it in their head. And I've been arguing with myself on the internet of what neoliberalism is. It's his most recent video, The March of Neoliberalism. And uh, he explains that it's you know, it's kind of just that the market, the market wins no matter what, and we'll create the markets and we'll push the markets and we don't care about the souls and the ideas and the hearts of any sort of people and that sort of stuff. And once again, like I said, I start questioning myself if neoliberalism is actually liberalism or if it is just kind of like a fascist level of liberalism, which James Lindsay has been pointing to for a while that the way they start incorporating all these kind of Marxist or left-wing stuff that we kind of have these dual polarities in the world going on where there's China that's been completely communist, but the way they've survived is they've started incorporating bits of fascism. Mm -hmm. Then we have the West that's been liberal, but we're kind of moving into the levels of incorporating fascist ideas, which is corporate, you know, corporatism. Right. And now we're, now we're flirting with all these, these Marxist ideas, which are all ultimately collectivist things. But I, I agree that that stuff's all kind of pushing that way and the problem with both of them is that they're both this is totally a criticism of both of them that i buy and i get and i get with my entire worldview of liberal atheist or whatever that that i hold on to is that the best criticism of all these right-wing people not that they have good answers for it is that thinking just materialism thinking just materially has a problem as a big problem it's if everybody becomes just materialist not only do we just become kind of move towards what these guys sneer at as capitalistic you know overuse but you also get this level of these technocratic ai type thinking people that we're all just these these nodes that need to be shipped around nodes in a network mm-hmm. and 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 we're not actually human beings and right it and takes- none of our interactions matter in the meantime and all that sorts of stuff it's just this march towards a technocratic super future or even the capitalism can kind of act like a technocracy in in a sort of way yeah i think we talked about this a little bit before like in one of our earlier episodes didn't we but i always kind of look at it as like you know just like like a corporation i mean a corporation is a legal person but it is not a real person and when you start pushing things through the corporation, and this may be a criticism of Yarvin, you know, and his monarchy type stuff. This is like, you know, you do do things for the for the corporation, but the corporation doesn't have any feelings. It doesn't have any. It doesn't have any compassion for for its members. Yeah. Yep. And and, and me, hard capitalism doesn't either. And you and I talked a little bit this week about how it's just true that capitalism is got this mechanism and it's almost kind of works like an AI being, if you could imagine it, that just is trying to figure out how to hack you, how to hack your needs, how to hack your desires, even create addictions in you. And right. that, that the mechanism is what, what creates that. It doesn't have to be like this top down, 
this top down uh, conspiracy to create that. It's just that we're selecting, we're constantly selecting for, you know, if, if we're going to try to make the best chip in the world, if the whole thing can have this process, like at first we found this fruit that, you know, James Lindsay and uh, Woke will frequently talk about this, the Bogiardian simulacra of like things slowly becoming fake over time. Yeah. But that, that, the postmodernists will kind of talk about that happening. And, you know, once again, it's, it's sort of a, uh, control away or something like that but it can happen naturally just in the selection process of capitalism that we have a peach and then we realize that we have we can make these peaches better and then people want the peach and then we sell the peach and then we figure out a way to sell a peach faster and then we figure out a way to can the peach then we figure out a way to put that peach with more sugar inside of a pie and then we figure out how to sell that pie then we figure out how to make that pie a little bit different so that it can go farther then we start yep. getting down to stuff of like where we're hiring scientists and technocrats to figure yeah. out mouth which mouth feel of which peaches. pie yeah. <laughs> yeah genetically modified peaches which yeah. mouth feel which crunch is exactly more satisfying yep. and how to maintain that crunch and packaging which packaging and gets the people and like just the selection process of that to get more on your plate you know um acts acts as a conspiracy theory does that make sense but uh, this is the this is sargon and and sargon is not a dark enlightenment guy he's just a guy who who uh gets very sympathetic to like a lot of ideas lately maybe he will ultimately land on dark enlightenment guy but they're covering how just recently like you said you don't know vanity fair positively covered yarvin this week which is really weird and really interesting yeah it's wild it also kind of goes against yarvin's viewpoint a little bit because part of Yar yarvin's idea is the only way you can ever have any real white right movement is you can't just the same way the postmodernists couldn't ever be named the voldemort thing yeah. so you got to stay away from being named you got to stay away from getting described because as soon as like that left wing juggernaut gets a hold of what you are then it can start squashing you. yeah right but if they have backing from things like they cover in this video from Peter Thiel and all that sorts of stuff, I mean, you, just, mm -hmm. you never know where stuff's going to start going. And obviously, Sargon's uh, sympathetic to a lot of it. Like I said, I'm sympathetic to a lot of the criticisms. I really am. I really am with them. Um, the problem is I don't think they have the answers. In fact, in a lot of those sorts of things, like Kevin said, some of those things I think an authentic religious person has has the answer they can give you the better answer they can talk about like those cycles or they can talk about authentically gelling with with your community but it's got to be authentic and it's one of those reasons i keep saying in the quick episode i said we put stuff on our shelves for everything and i was telling some other people this week like what i was referring to there is that i i have a shelf for liberalism you know they, they talk mm -hmm. about mormonism like you put the things that are kind of like don't quite jive on your shelf because you can't quite answer them, you can't quite figure them out yet. You, you don't quite know, but you're still going to hold on to your thing, right? And I'm, I still, my classical liberalism, I have a shelf, and the shelf's heavy, you know what I mean? But I, I'm still holding on to liberalism. I'm still holding on to classical liberalism, all that sorts of stuff. But what one of the one of the concepts of one of the problems with liberalism is that it's true that it gets overly materialistic, and we lose our community through it. And one of the by your fruits, you shall know things that I always argue for Mormons and what they say for is to, to me, Mormon book reviews, Steve from Mormon book reviews always said it. He said, man, one of the most amazing things about Mormonism is it's Peterson just had a, an interview with Dawkins this week where he started talking to Dawkins about the pragmatism right. because he can never make Dawkins start talking about it. Vander Clay covered it pretty well, but it's not a fallacy to say, oh my gosh, these guys made the desert bloom. These guys, and I just fully hold on to and agree. And it's even like a wag in my finger at the the midnight Mormons who might in a in a dark enlightenment way say all of our suburban boomerism in nineteen nineties Utah was uh, was never real or something like I don't know if they say it exactly that way because I think they'd be totally <laughs> fine with me defending Salt Lake City Mormonism, you know what I mean? But yeah. but they do sneer and snicker at it. And my defense of it is like, no. It was authentic. We were authentic. Yeah. We were authentic. Pardon my French. We were authentic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so let's get down to short fat. This, this was the, the video that we were going to do the whole thing on. But the short fat Taco did uh, really on it just this week, given his general criticism. But the problem with it is, is like, 
if you didn't know kind of who he's talking about, because you got to realize that downstream from Nick Land and downstream from Yarvin are a million and one kind of 4 chan YouTubers or not. There's a billion, a million of them. Right. And uh, once again, like I said, I'm not fully at odds with them. I would just do the same. James Lindsay has the same criticism and I agree with them. James Lindsay has been too dismissive of them. But uh, James Lindsay's answer for them is a good answer. And I think it's Peterson's answer too, is that the answer out of it is authenticity and not authenticity used in that leftist way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like your authentic self. Yeah. It's, it's, it's authentic, authentic belief, authentic just, interaction with people. Just being real. Being honest about where you are and what you right. feel, but being authentic in relationships, being authentic in, in, uh, your struggle with belief. Kevin and I saw Peterson here in Utah and he, he gave that great answer to somebody. I wish, I don't think there's a clip of it yet, but what did he say again? The thing that you're lacking is humility. And that struggling that the, the real truth of whatever oh, yeah. belief is, the belief is, is, you know, we talked about Israel and all that sort of stuff that, that if you're yeah, somebody who's struggling who... with it, that you're kind of showing a belief there, you know? I think the, the, which I, I thought was kind of interesting because I, I took the take, um, you know, he kind of talked about the, yeah, talked about, I guess, I think the, the name Jacob means he who wrestles with God, right? Mm -hmm. And then the name of, then the, one of the translations like that Nelson pointed out of Israel after his name was changed is um, letting God prevail, which I think is an interesting concept, sort of like wrestle, he who wrestles with God and lets God prevail. Yeah. So there's, there's some sort of level of maybe Yarvin saying that like ironically, the rest of the guy mm -hmm. ironically start acting like you believe a thing and i know there's a lot of online stuff of like you know pomo trads let's call it postmodern trads who are people who are just going to go act like they're real deal traditionalists fake it till they make it in that way and i know there's truth in fake it till you make it in the world i absolutely believe like in the workout world fake it till you make yeah. it it's an awesome thing to do and all that sorts of stuff but what i really think about it is and i even kind of criticize the distributors but I think the distributor is trying to really authentically try to fake it till he makes it and uh, mm -hmm. believing stuff and that sort of deal. But I think it all more matters in the end of things about how you act and interact with the people in and around. You. Well, I think that is, that's the, the whole essence of being the fool before you can get good at something. You have to genuinely put yourself out there and you have to genuinely put yourself into it in a genuine way and allow yourself to be the fool before you can become the master at something. Yeah, for sure. Okay. okay. Let's, let's That's kind of the whole this. Peterson thing. This is a, earlier. this is for a talk. We're doing a big critique of it and the nature of progress. And one of the main areas that's, that, that's their problem. And, and you'll see both of the, both sides, the right and left side kind of have the same avoidance of this word because they know that it's, they know what it means when he uses this word, but they know that they also have a problem with thinking it and that's utopia, utopianism, you know, and, um, let's go. I made a video a couple of years ago called what is a reactionary examining the meaning of the word, the political meaning, not the general one, which is literally just somebody who reacts to stuff. The description of that video reads revolutionist seems to be a privilege only afforded to the left, but the reality is progress does not simply go in one political direction. I was on the right track, but there were still a few things I didn't understand. To begin with, the political definition of reactionary is a person or a set of views opposing political or social liberalization or reform, or alternatively, a person who holds political views that favor a return to the status quo ante, the previous political state of society, which that person believes possessed positive characteristics absent. There's me an argument about the, the notion of that because there's absolutely like a concept that if you're using the actual word reactionary that there's a left-wing reactionary but from contemporary society an easy joke to make uses the first definition of the word since that definition points toward political or social liberalization moving away from a liberalism or being somehow anti-liberal means that you're a reactionary which makes socialists reactionary sock done left had his jimmy's rustled when i trolled twitter with this joke but you didn't actually have a reply but it is just a joke not a real criticism the more serious definition of reactionary is that sock don't don't worry if you find a definition that goes against what they like they'll get that definition changed pretty quick mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> It's what bread tubers use to label the Nazbols, the national Bolsheviks of Russia, as simultaneously both reactionary and on the left. At least the more honest ones admit that they're on the left, just a part of the left they don't like. The slimier ones try to pretend that the Nazbols are right-wing. Russell Brand is a socialist, but he has conspiracy brain and his whole channel has become anti-vax stuff. Really? He's like a socialist guy? Sounds like some like weird 
Naz bullshit? I don't know. By the way, the national Bolsheviks are a faction within Russia that want to see a return to the Soviet Union's political and economic systems. They're simultaneously authoritarian leftists from the political compass and reactionary in that they favor a return to a previous status quo. I do want to consider the label. What previous state of society do I want to return to? And in that state, are there actually values found there that we're currently lacking? I think there's an easy answer to those questions. In terms of freedom of expression, we were significantly more free, at least culturally, 20 years ago than we are now. And by some very loose definition, that does- The, the, the way I'll say it, because I mean, I, I don't like the term reactionary. I'm not a reactionary unless, unless you are saying go back to a liberalism now. <laughs> you know, I like to say I'm 1990s Amish. Like, I think that's kind of where we should have stopped. <laughs> like, the Amish use technology up to their, up to, you know, they'll use like the wagon wheel and, and the fire and, and the lamp mm -hmm. and all that sorts of stuff. But then after that, everything after that was good. And uh, I think we should, uh, we should have all just kind of stopped right around the year 2000. But there's no way to do that is making a reactionary. But we're not simply doing the what is a reactionary video again. That's not the title of this video. We're talking about something that is related but different. And let me show you what inspired it. A while ago, there was a bit of drama where I made a video about the alt-right pipeline. And then Xander Hall responded to it. And then I responded to that on Adam Sitch. And then Xander Hall said he'd come on the stream and then he didn't. And then Xander Hall ducked a future talk with me and also ducked one with Sargon, leaving Chud Logic wondering what was going on. Yeah, this whole thing was like a month ago. I was inspired to do this video back then and I just sat on the idea. Sorry. During that Adam and Sitch stream in Xander Hall's comment section, there was one message that briefly caught my eye, but there was no real way to talk about it in the moment. And here it is. I find it kind of funny how right wingers always say the left used to be X, but now it's too far. Like, bro, that's the point of progressivism, that we progress. We don't just sit at one place politically. 300 years ago, totally abolishing the monarchy in favor of a liberal democracy was far left and crazy, but I moved on. As things change and we learn and experience, and as a society, we move forward and progress. In other words, to progress means always to move leftward. In this guy's point of view, the shifting of the overtone of window leftward over time is not only expected, not only required, but it is indeed a natural process of history. It's just how it is. Progressing not only means moving leftward over time, it means that it is the proper state of history to move leftward, that history itself has an animating force pushing society left. If you think I'm exactly... But I mean, I would say that the right wing reactionaries um, or the Yarvins of the world say that that's just what happens. They're not saying should, but they're mm -hmm. saying it does and did and will, and it's just going to keep happening until you get through the cycle of pride. Right. Exaggerating here, it's not hard to find a bread who will pair this exact sentiment. It objectively is the case. I mean, by any standard whatsoever. It's kind of pathetic that I, I've watched a bunch of debates with this dude just as a. <laughs> Not, not just now, but like going back years, I've watched a bunch of debates with this uh, uh, guy dressed as corn. But the, I don't even know his name, but it's kind of funny because there's like a ton of different names. But if you really want to see kind of like actual sort of centrist, I mean, they're centrist. I'd even say Sitch and Adam might be even a little bit more left of me nowadays, but they're yeah. sort of centrist. And then they did, they debated recently the distributors. I sent those to you. I don't know if you listen to them, but if you want to see kind of fireworks between a right wing reactionary and centrist, uh, that's, that's a place you could watch. Them. Historically, as you move linearly in time forward, political opinions move left. That's not an argument. Like you, you literally, you, you, it's progress. This is how it works. It's just how, it's just how humans operate. Yes, and Yarvin points to saying that could be an entropy that you're blind to. What are you talking about? Literally, yes. It always moves left. It's also not hard to find a bread trooper who will point out, just like that commenter, that a progressive who fails to progress with the times will eventually become a reactionary. You motherfuckers LARP as progressives until progressivism, or the idea of challenging social norms, suddenly overlaps with the norm that you like. I hate it when people like you act like that. It's so frustrating. Progressivism isn't just about being pro-gay or whatever the hell's okay. It's about a fundamental, unconditional willingness to challenge social norms, or at the very least to be understanding of the ways in which those social norms are formed and the influences those can have socially, okay? That's progressivism. Because if you're just progressive because you're like pro-gay or pro-trans or whatever, you're going to be the next reactionary. You can't, it's not enough to just be pro-whatever social shit people are for these days, okay? You need to have a general awareness of, of how all these like reactionary takes are, are beget by the normalization of social values, okay? So in the mind... Thinks Bausch is the king of all sophists. Mm-hmm of these people, the neutral position isn't actually remaining still. Neutrality is drifting leftward slowly over time. Progressivism is actively moving leftward quickly over time. And if you do remain at a standstill, you are automatically shifting right, because it's not you that's actually moving, but the political landscape itself, shifting beneath your feet. Some might even say that people don't actually become more conservative as they age. Rather, their culture becomes more progressive over time, and their old progressive opinions become conservative ones as they get older. This is the source of those right-wing memes that show conservatives of the future arguing for progressive policies of today. And this is why I talked about being a reactionary at the start of the video, because Vosh correctly pointed out that, in the minds of many progressives, there are only two camps, them and reactionaries. And the more left you are, the more progressive you are. The more right you are, the more reactionary you are. So a person who is extremely progressive is going to be viewed as a reactionary by somebody who is just even a little bit further left than them. This entire interpretation rests on the assumption that progress and reaction are two forces that always oppose, and that to make gains in one necessarily must mean that you lose in the other. But I think that we can show that this is not exactly true. So many people on the left are desperately trying to redefine the Nazbols as right wing or other reactionary left elements like TERFs, for example, even though they're clearly on the left. Because that's where you get back to the everything starts arguing of definitions, you know. Mm, yeah. I could really jump into. I could really jump into it and start saying neoliberalism shouldn't be 
shouldn't be grouped in with liberalism at all. I mean, I think that's, yeah. I mean, that's a, I'm sure somebody somewhere is making it, but that's one I just thought of this week and said, why are, why are, why is liberal, liberalism even taking that one on the chin? I'm taking, because yeah. if you were, if you were a left winger or a Marxist, a Marxist, they, they scream that every, every change of Marxism is nowhere near what their Marxism is. Yep. Well, fine. Then the neoliberalism isn't liberalism. We're going to play that game. Because these are groups that are simultaneously progressive and reactionary. They want a return to a previous status quo because they believe that that previous status quo represented more progress than what we're currently living in. Consider this. Whenever a right-wing candidate wins an election or a piece of left-wing policy falls apart, normies on social media will often post Star Trek memes. Star Trek is the progressive utopia in pop fiction. And these memes are often accompanied with stuff like, I thought we were moving forward, or this is the future that Democrats want. They view progress as being a unidirection. There is no way that the left right now, I mean, they even have a new Star Trek generation, Star Trek Picard series that's basically going around apologizing for how toxic that series was. That's yeah, really the, yeah. The theme of the new se season. Season. Well, it just goes to show that, you know, everything's entropy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why movies are dwindling, although, except for I saw Top Gun and that was really good. So. Yeah, I just watched part one again yesterday. I'm going to see part two. It made me sad though. I get sad when I watch that stuff. And I said, I watch Seinfeld and I feel sad. Yeah. Just yeah. recently, Did I was you... rewatching some Sex in the City and not because I wanted to watch the stupid show of the women. I wanted to see 1990s yeah, New it's York. True. It's the nostalgia, man. Yeah. It's, and, and, and just going back, going back to that whole thing, like we, we did do it. Like the 90s was, it was, it was legit. But that's what Fukuyama called the end of history. But then it, uh, it topples into this stuff. And then these right-wing guys say, well, that's going to always happen with this. But Ezra Taft Benson got there first. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cycle of pride. <laughs> path, an arrow that points at the bright, shining, utopian city on the hill where all of humanity's problems are solved. And the only possible way you could disagree with them is if you were stupid or evil. It couldn't be because they're wrong, because they want what's good. They're for progress, after all. Meanwhile, somebody like a Nazbol is much more likely to view the future like it looks and follow. If you're living in a post-apocalyptic, tribalistic, nuclear wasteland, you would be a reasonable person to long for a return to that old civilization, that old status quo of prosperity, even if it's reactionary to do so. Because the future isn't actually that good in that case. We don't even need to use these extreme, detached from reality examples either. Is it progress that in democrat-controlled cities we see spiking drug use and urban decay? Is it reactionary to prefer a time in the past where there was more social cohesion? In other words, progressives view the nature of progress as being something like a technology tree in a game of civilization you level up your progress the new thing eventually becomes outdated and those who cling to it become real and that's where nick land I mean, we mentioned it earlier but he, he really kind of does get the, the schizophrenic idea so does yarvin is like our almost this transhumanist thing and go listen to the transhumanists who talked with uh, john lynn who are mormon transhumanists they really have this this hegelian or this Voldemort or the, the nintendo thing we talked about earlier that we're going to create the thing we're going to create the god and then we'll just kind of mm -hmm. fade away and right reactionary in the process and progress there's here. only one way to go and that is up but in reality there's actually a lot wrong with this conception of progress for example take the classical fascists the socialists of today use reactionary to refer to fascism or fascist adjacent they have no problem calling people fascists for no reason but if their target is such that it's too much of a reach even for them they'll say reactionary instead i've heard people like it's a gundam or turkey tom be called reactionary because they make videos laughing at dumb fucks on social media and yeah they're literally reacting but that's not the point the point is that they're laughing at the silly things people do in the name of progress which itself is a step towards suppressing progress by making people feel embarrassed for doing things that are progressive so if you're making fun of something that's progressive you're reactionary obviously though iconic classes and comedians who laugh at everything, including laughing at the left, are not fascists. But progressives treat them like they are because if you're not progressing properly, you're a reactionary and they view fascism as the natural end result of reactionary tendencies. That's why capitalism decays into fascism in their view, because progression is abandoning capitalism for socialism. Or why liberalism props up fascism, because progression is overthrowing liberalism with socialism. It's all the same logic. Either you're a progressive socialist or you're a reactionary fascist. If you claim to be neither, you automatically assist the reaction against revolution. It's very George Bush in a way. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. The problem with this view is that it's not true. Joseph de Maistre was the first reactionary and the first one to really write about the philosophy of reaction. In the context of the French Revolution, de Maistre critiqued the Enlightenment as a destabilizing social force, that a monarchy ordained by God was the only form of government that had political legitimacy, and that the only way to cultivate social cohesion was through strict authority and hierarchy. His writing created the philosophical basis for modern European traditional conservatism, contrasting that with Edmund Burke's English liberal conservatism. In The Doctrine of Fascism, Mussolini writes at length about reactionaryism and de Maistre. The fascist negation of socialism, democracy, and liberalism should not, however, be interpreted as implying a desire to drive the world backwards to the positions occupied prior to 1789, a year commonly referred to as that which opened. The Everything's just a cycle, man. Everything just comes back to that other thing. Mm -hmm. I know you got a bell pretty quick, but uh, this is really the end of it. I don't know what else to fast forward to in this, except for hitting all of it and then just wrapping it up. Or is there something you wanted to say on all this, if you need to bail out? No, I mean, it's, I think this is just wrapping everything up, like what we've talked about and yeah, I, I don't <laughs> Yeah, it's it's you kind of get a bigger picture of the whole entire thing and how they're all intertwined and interlapped and it's all just kind of an endless battle of chaos. And I once again push back to the uh, 
disliking and, and I want to get to a point in the future where we're going to cover the way a bunch of these different ideas from these different people start coming into different types of religious apologists and I don't like those religious apologists we're going to mm -hmm. we're going to cover some of them but ultimately what I don't like about this I don't like it very much about Yarvin although I do think he is somewhat humble I don't like it about land I don't like it about the Adorno I don't like it about Horkheimer is the nos the, the Gnosticism of it, yeah. the Hermeticism of the one that you're going to be the one who's going to figure it out. You're the one who has all the answers. You're the one who right. found all the esoteric knowledge and you're going to bring it all to us and we're going to figure this thing out and do it right through our stuff. So I'll just keep watching this and, and just maybe say some things. If you got run, just, just let me know. And okay. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to duck out. So anyway, uh, yeah, it was. I don't know how much editing of this. Maybe I'll just put this one up as if it were a live stream. So, I mean, there's some cuss words in it and stuff like that, but maybe I'll just say this one's going to be explicit because I think some of those points had to be made through the cuss words. Oh, well, that's too late already. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we've gone through a number of videos already that have yeah, yeah. plenty. So. <laughs> Sweet. But I think most of our audience kind of just takes it with a, grain, with a grain of salt. So, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Throw some comments in, you know, this is some, some, this kind of blew, has blown my, my mind open here a little bit more as we've been kind of looking into this. So I, I think that stuff that I was, I was kind of maybe a little bit blind to before. So hopefully this has helped other people kind of well, see some different things. Well, too. we're going to try to hit on it more, but I think it's also, we kind of had to go through it because both the left and the right wing side of it, both of them are getting grafted on into weird Mormon world arguments mm -hmm. maybe to some level people see or don't yeah. see here so right on yep okay all right well talk to you later late Century. history does not travel backwards the fascist doctrine has not taken de Maistre as its prophet monarchical absolutism is of the past dead and done are feudal privileges and division of society into closed uncommunicating castes the fascist state is however a unique and original creation it is not reactionary but revolutionary for it anticipates the solution of certain universal problems which have been raised elsewhere fascism has outgrown the dilemma monarchy versus republic so all these things like the alexander dugan stuff the thing he'll talk about is th these people talk a lot about the three ways and the first is is liberalism First, because it's the biggest obstacle to beat. They got they got to beat up modernism and liberalism, and uh, the second is communism, and then the third is they won't like to just say fascism, but it is ultimately fascism. But now they're saying that like the Dugan way is the fourth way, and it's kind of this this idea of uh, Dugan says he's going to base it in Heidegger. He's going to base it in the Dasein of of Heidegger, the, the the being of the and the becoming of a person. And I don't know, I don't know if it's that different than some other stuff, but it's, it's trying to invent a new and different way than what's dominated the past century of politics. Sure over which democratic regimes too long dallied, attributing all insufficiencies to the former and proning the latter as a regime of perfection. Whereas experience teaches that some republics are inherently reactionary and absolutist, while some monarchies accept the most daring political and social experiments. Look at the language used in these passages. The classical fascists view themselves not as reactionary, but revolutionary. They view themselves as the solution to the capitalist versus socialist problem. In Hegelian terms, they view themselves as the synthesis to the thesis of capitalism and the antithesis of socialism. If you're a leftist watching this video, I already know what you're saying to yourself in your head. The fascists lied about everything. They just wanted to get people on their side. But no government commonly called a fascist ever actually instituted a true return to the past. Hitler did not rebuild any of the old German empires or call Kaiser Wilhelm back to the throne from exile in the Netherlands. In fact, the Nazis hated the old German institutions. Mussolini viewed Italy's Catholicism not as a part of the conservative indigenous culture to be protected, but as a barrier hindering its consolidation of power. Japan had no desire to return to a pre meiji Restoration feudalistic era. Spain never had any desire to return to its old imperial ways, instead transitioning towards autarky, an economic move that is characteristically un-Spanish. The behaviors of these governments may not be revolutionary in the specific ways that terminally online socialists would prefer, but they clearly weren't seeking a return to a past state of politics. This isn't just my analysis either. Utopian fascism is a topic that's been studied extensively. Utopia, in the political sense, is the end state of progress, the final goal. When all progressing has been done, when all possible improvements have been made, when every project Utopia, but once again, Yarvin and those other guys will criticize the Whig historicism of liberalism, saying that we had a utopian vision of it all too, the Star Trek utopian vision. But I, I think there's some part of the liberalism that always meant to have a cleaning mechanism in there, and that cleaning mechanism realized that the, the balances of powers and, and that sort of stuff, the cleaning mechanism was supposed to be something that admitted that it can't be utopian or perfect or done by something that the constitution is laws against the government, not laws against the people supposedly once was, but a lot of these guys like Michael Mallison and Eric July will point out that the constitution itself has problems and issues. And even that mechanism, that self-correcting mechanism becomes government. Those are they're strong. They're strong arguments. They're strong criticisms. They're stuff, they're stuff for the liberal shelf.
has reached its culmination. Human society achieves its perfection. And the fascists, rather than grasping for the imperfection of the past, had their own conception of utopia, separate from the leftist view of the stateless, moneyless, classless communism. The term reactionary modernism was coined by historians to try and explain- I would say over time, because like I said, I'm a Roger Scruton type guy. Just, I'm not that, I'm not that. And uh, over time I do, I, I, I don't fall into the level of going all the way to anarchy, but I do f find myself pushing every year slightly more right and and he says maybe it's because the the rights moving this way it's shifting their ground but i ultimately do think i go back moved more towards libertarianism more towards less laws or better but there's just still some things in the world that i think you can't get around not having a law for it especially if you land on things and there's gray areas in these things well first off there's the thomas locke stuff the things you have right to right to life right to uh, liberty right to property and that stuff I mean, obviously they say nine tenths of the law is about property so that's so law just gets created out of that but i, I don't know how you guard that explain this great contradiction within fascism, where they had a great admiration for the concept of progress, but they nonetheless rejected the socialist vision of it. The reason this appears to be a contradiction is because of the, it's the trap. having a vision of the future that only exists in theory inside your head, and then every move towards it is progress. Every move away from it is regress, regardless of the actual cause and effect of the moves in reality. If you already have a mental structure in your head that says feudalism to capitalism to socialism to communism, all traveling along a conveyor belt, anything that doesn't fit into that move has to instead be pushing backwards. But like I said earlier, the fascists viewed themselves, not communism, as the stage beyond socialism. Again, the socialist reply to this is to says fascists lie. You cannot trust anything they say or write. They're subversive. They will do anything to gain power. Putting aside for the moment that sound like nearly every single socialist online right now, it's also an anti-intellectual position to deliberately avoid an entire wing of knowledge simply because it comes from people you don't like. Dr. David Roberts, history professor at the University of Georgia, writes in his book, Fascist Interactions, that the greatest advance in fascist studies over the last 40 years has come precisely from taking the fascist self-understanding seriously. By now, it is widely held. I think you gotta listen. I think you gotta listen to anybody. I think, and I think that's actually even a criticism for, I think that's a criticism for Peterson and James Lindsay even, and people like Michael Malice or, or Eric July or, or Dave Smith, perhaps, do better than that, some of the libertarian anarchists. That fascism was not some revolt against modernity, but the quest for an alternative modernity. This would imply that it was not merely an effort to catch up to the modern democracies through different, more extreme means. And rather than merely counter or blue as an ongoing directionary method, is called Whig historiography. The Whigs were a British liberal movement before liberalism was a thing. What they were all about isn't too important right now, but they had a view of history as being a journey, where humanity travels from an oppressive, cruel past into a glorious, advanced future. They believe the ultimate culmination of Whig historiography was liberal democracy and constitutional monarchy. The phrase Whig historiography was originally coined as a satirical term, but was eventually adopted by the Whigs and later the liberals in the UK. The idea is that history has a goal that it actively moves towards rather than simply existing. This is where you get the phrase the end of history. Socialism is built atop of the concept of Whig historiography, that history has a goal it actively moves towards, but they disagree that the end stage is liberal democracy. Marx's view, being a revision of the Whigist view, considered socialism to be the next stage after liberalism. Mussolini's view, being a revision of the Marxist view, considered fascism to be the next stage after socialism. It doesn't stop there. For example, Alexander Dugan, stylized as Putin's philosopher, much like Gentile was Mussolini's, and the creator of the national Bolshevik ideology, wrote his own book on this topic, The Fourth Political Theory. He views his ideas as the next step beyond fascism, like Mussolini saw fascism being beyond socialism, and Marx saw socialism being beyond liberalism. His theory, the fourth theory, therefore, is progress beyond those big three, at least according to him. This end of history, march of progress rhetoric, is appealing to many people that the left would call reactionary, even though reactionaryism Explicitly rejects the march of progress rather than searching for alternative modes of progress that the fascists do. And this is where we come to the core of the issue. Fascists are not reactionaries. Fascists still worship the concept of progress in the same way that progressives and socialists do. They just have a different meaning of progress. Actual reactionaries reject the very concept of progress itself, and in doing so, they simultaneously reject socialism and fascism. It is this distinction between a fascist and a reactionary that I don't think anybody on the online left understands right now. And I think that's why they have a hard time quantifying right wing politics beyond simply saying the right is bad and then getting upvotes online. Julius of Vola was a philosopher in fascist Italy, and he is considered a fascist by many, but he called himself a super fascist. What he meant by that was he considered the classical fascists as not being fascist enough for his tastes. And his writing would ultimately discard classical fascism for not being reactionary. Ebola's most famous work, Revolt Against the Modern World, is explicitly anti-modern in all of its forms, liberal, socialist, and fascist. The neo-reactionary movement, otherwise known as the Dark Enlightenment, are, true to their name, explicit. What's funny about it is that Ebola also has these concepts of hierarchy and hierarchy, like it's, it's like a Marxist, almost hierarchy, I wouldn't say Marxist, I mean an egalitarian hierarchy, that we still maintain all the hierarchies, everybody has their place, you're stuck in your place, you know, there's an elite, he's very elitist, and kings should not, a little bit like how uh, Yarvin argues for a king, and kings should not, <laughs> elitists should not think of themselves as common people. It's one of the bad parts of liberalism is, is an elitist thinking at all that they have anything to do with these common people. But the but then it should be egalitarian in in what's available to the people. It's like in this like utopian way, you're gonna everybody's gonna have the same, but we will all properly do our jobs from peasant to king. Yeah. You know?
bedrocks of the reaction. Evola is one of their bedrocks, along with anarcho-capitalists like Hop and modern figures like Menchus Mulba. Rather than seeking an alternative progress like the fascists do, rather than declaring themselves the next stage in the march of history, they reject Whig historiography altogether. They advocate and reject progress as a virtue, rather than arguing over what constitutes the next stage of it. And when socialists call everyone who's not them reactionary or fascist, they just don't understand the words they're using. When people out there call it's a Gundam or Turkey Palm or myself reactionary YouTubers, they have no clue what they're talking about. We may not agree with your conception of progress or the fascist one, for that matter, but that doesn't mean that we reject progress entirely. We have our own idea of what it is. We don't want to return to a previous political paradigm a priori. We may want to see the restoration of virtues lost to the past, not because it's in the past, but because we view society as having regressed. It's the difference between looking at a past era and wanting it because it represents going back and the concept of progress is bad. That's the reactionary view. And looking at a past era and wanting it returned because it actually represents real progress. And the path that we've gone down is fake progress. And that is where I am. I'm not a reactionary. I don't value regression. But I don't believe that what the socialists or the fascists call progressive actually contains any real progress at all. They're all just different flavors of failure, distinct from each other, but nothing I'm interested in. There, there's some sort of level too, or is you, you gotta be a realist. But I, I think Yarvin kind of prides himself on being a realist too, of viewing things in ultimately realist fashion of, of how does this stuff actually play out or how does it actually affect any sort of bottom line. He has a lot of thought on, on that in a lot of different areas that I could never even start to cover. But when I say I'm 90s Amish, I'm also, uh, I'm not ridiculous. There's no going back to that. There's no, so, so we do have to figure some way through. And I know local distance keeps saying it. So there's no way through, we're in postmodernism now. And we're looking at both sides of it here. And there's no way, there's no way out but through it. But do I have the answers on that? I'm trying to figure them out. I'm figuring them out by like looking around, trying stuff out, thinking about things, looking at lenses, trying to just be authentic in what I believe in and act on trying to improve myself when I can improve myself, trying to improve my relationships when I can improve my relationships. I can't be perfect and all that sorts of stuff. But I, I, one of the biggest, baddest things I just have the nastiest skepticism for is anybody who has all the knowledge, who tells me they know where all the Triforce pieces are, who tells me where all the pieces of Dracula are so I can form Dracula back together, who knows about all the Horcruxes and has all these different little secret esoteric answers. They, um, but the way I, I'm curious, I will listen to all their little <laughs> detailed answers. But then usually what happens is I read through all of it, I look through all of it, I see all their pieces they're putting together, and I say, it's an interesting lens. Let's look at another lens. Nobody's figured it out perfectly. I mentioned the Hegelian method earlier, and that's partially because Hegel's view of history is the ultimate end of the concept of progress. Whether it's socialist or fascist or either type of ist, Hegel's view is that the march of progress and history automatically engaging in that march, a view called historicism, has its natural end in the authoritarian... So I, I like, I've mentioned from the very start, I like Verveke and Peterson, and the reason I like them is people can say whatever, like, Yarvin covered this first, or such and such philosopher covered that more in depth, so, so. What people don't get is, or seem to fall back on very well, and Verveke explains it very well, is that it's ultimately action. It's the Platonic dialectic, not the Hegelian dialectic. It's you learn all the things just to figure out how you can act, how you can act in the world and get around and do better and minute to minute, day by day, you know, just act, act in the world better, knowing what's out there and the way other people think or think they think. That's one of the bigger problems, you know, the whole Freudian thing or one of the Peterson things that I think Peterson was great at labeling out as well, that other people don't as well. Yarvin gets into it a little bit though too. People think they think stuff and they don't act like they think stuff. I just got an entire, my friend of mine sent over, he's a real estate guy. He sent over a PhD for a lady that he's shopping for a house with and her PhD's in pushing DEI in the workforce. And she makes some $200,000 a year and is buying a big giant house. She does not act what she believes. She does not believe what she acts. Bureaucratic state. This would later be coined as totalitarian by the fascists. But the socialists would also embrace this concept, where Mussolini would say, all within the state, the socialists would say everything is political. It's the same concept, two sides of the same coin. A utopia in its perfection would have to be totalitarian, because perfection means perfection in all places. That's why they always say real social has never been tried. It has to be everywhere, so that the imperfection of other locations cannot simply upend the construction. A utopia in its perfection would have to be bureaucratic, because if, as Mussolini said, everything is within the state, everything needs to be controlled and managed. A utopia in its perfection would have to be a thing. Evola, Julius Evola, this real fascism has never been tried authoritarian because if you've already got everything perfectly correct there is no need to tolerate any more dissent or debate or people leaving and going their own way all utopianism regardless of political slant is totalitarian and all political movements that believe in the march of progress in this historicism that history has a teleology is ultimately utopian the neo-reactionaries might reject this whole process but i think they throw the baby out with the bathwater for all of the ills of modernity it's brought with it a lot of good so the question is what's the solution to this problem max weber was a german historian and economist founder of the field that would later be known as sociology and the inventor of the concept of methodological individualism the idea that and that class dynamics are ultimately just illusions this idea was accepted by neoclassical economists austrian economists i think pretty much every economic school the socialists, but it's not a purely economic idea. What? The Austrian economists, I love them. I love almost all Hans Hermann Hoppe, the um, 
Mises, the Mises caucus right now is one of my biggest white pills. Sticks Hexenheimer was talking about them today. It's a white pill. The stuff that I like the most lands in that realm far more. The problem is, is forming a full entire worldview and ideology out of it. Although maybe it's the whole entire concept of a full entire worldview ideology that we're all supposed to gather around more than just, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to, to, to make the group the you know, so far I love the individualism, but I absolutely hear all of the uh, criticisms and pushback of like, but we got to be a group. There's, as they say, the right wing will say, you ultimately have to accept the Yarvins and the lands of the world that identity politics is just a realism, that it just happens and it's going to happen. I don't know if I fully grab that. I, I totally believe, I mean, I know that just even ethnicity and all that sorts of stuff, there's a lot of overlap about people who believe absolutely the same thing. Um, and they don't have to be the exact same ethnicity or race and all that sorts of stuff. And I, I can find tribe and all that sort of stuff. I just don't, I don't believe the demographics or destiny, the far right and the far left do. I don't, that's one area where I'll just never quite align with one or, one or the other on that side. But I do believe that, that ideas can transcend that stuff. Or one of the best things that I always point to in Mormonism, people call Mormonism racist or whatever. It was one of the, those sorts of religions and Catholicism and all that sorts of, it's one of the only ways that race really, really is able to get overlooked for something that becomes a unifying quality, a religion. It can trump ethnicity, but then that hasn't been perfect. Sometimes there's ethnic religions that are fighting for each other. Well, we all know, we all know the history of that. Well, some of it, enough of it to sneer at. Weber's interest was in the intersection of economics and history, and he is known for saying, history consists of individual relations and events, and it is not the job of those who study history to develop from it a social science or ideology to guide our way. I think my view of progress is more in line with Weber's idea. There is no end of history. There is no destiny that human society must pursue at all costs. Or is it and that was generally my idea coming out of just general religion too, is that, that it's kind of one of the things I go arguing for Mormons about why Mormons should hold on to some of their some of what makes their society good or makes the desert bloom or made their society very strong and very, um, you can call them capitalistic. Gosh, they, they bloomed, the desert bloomed out here. And one of the things they did that came from all their general beliefs and some of them they're thrown by the wayside and it, they will, that progress will become, it will become entropy and <laughs> I believe it'll become entropy and I maybe come from an angle of saying Mormons now hold on hold on to that some of that stuff maybe I don't align with every single one of it but but I I know I benefit from the society that you helped build around here but if you hold on to to all of it I don't believe there has to be an eschatology except for the giant red sun burning this place down when it grows large enough there doesn't have to be an end times and then like a reformation afterwards but maybe that's my wishful thinking. Maybe there's going to be an eschatology one way or the other because us humans push towards it and make it happen no matter what. Uh, nod to Dostoyevsky. Exist at all costs, as the reactionaries would have it. There is no utopia that we can build. History does not naturally trend leftward over time or towards socialism or fascism or anything else. No movement in any direction, left, right, or other, can truly be considered progress or regress beyond your own personal views. A great example of what I'm talking about is this one article I came across coming out of Minnesota when preparing for the Roe v. Wade Cubcast. I want you to pay close attention to the language used by the pro-life people in this article. If the U.S. Supreme Court were to throw out the Roe v. Wade decision, abortions would remain legal in Minnesota due to a state's Supreme Court ruling back in 1995. The ruling, known as Doe v. Gomez, guaranteed the right to abortion in Minnesota and required the state to cover the cost for low-income patients. In order for us to move forward here in Minnesota, we do have to get rid of Doe versus Gomez. Getting rid of Roe versus Wade and then Doe versus Gomez are going to be big steps in the right direction for us to ultimately restore protection for unborn children in Minnesota, where through most of our history, the unborn were protected. Even though the pro-life guy appeals to history, he also uses progressive terminology. And I don't mean progressive in terms of the political group, but in terms of appealing to progress. He says phrases like moving forward and steps in the right direction. Because ultimately, everybody views themselves as progressing towards whatever they want. That's what progression is. If you want food from your fridge and then you walk over and get it, the act of walking is progressing towards that goal. The word progress simply means what you desire. And to make progressivism into a political school simply attaches a moral framework that centers your desire as an a priori good by calling somebody regressive or reactionary for not agreeing with your desires, or by worshiping your own theorized end state as a utopian progressive vision, all you're doing is exerting control over other people. That is what is at the bottom of all progressive views. Progressives are good because they have the desire they have, everyone else is bad, and that's that. I just can't get behind any of this stuff. I don't I mean, that, the reaction. That's a major part of all the, the uh, pol politics anyway. We all know it is like turning euphemisms out of words and then like taking over certain words. I saw just this week uh, over on Zelf on the Shelf them saying, oh, I can't believe they turned anti-fascist into a a bad word. Well, you turned the word pro-choice into a bad word, or, or not pro-choice, pro-life. I can't believe you turned the words 
the words pro-life into a bad word. Oh, that you you can't believe that they turned anti-fascist into a bad word. Oh my gosh, everybody's been playing that game forever. But progressives somehow got the corner on the market of using that word of saying that. I mean, I guess that's always been a political game is try to put in there a word of something that sounds like a um, desirable or like you'll be the desirable thing. But generic idea that the past was entirely better. All there you go. Zelf on the Shelf, Nuance Hole and Zelf on the Shelf or Sam or whatever covered determinism this week in the Sam Harris level determinism, which I think is a whole other ball of wax of, of goofy, goofy AI brain technocrats thinking that they can galaxy brain solve everything for us. And that's, that's a whole other thing too. Maybe we'll cover that. This, we got, we got to go down these roads to cover a bunch of this stuff because I want to cover a bunch of weird apologists and weird divinity school people who are coming in and trying to push their ideas and beware of Gnosticism, beware of utopianism, beware of people who think they figured out the answers for us all. Beware. All the time, we should implement any of the old systems. But I also don't believe that progress moves in any one direction, regardless of what direction that is. And that people who don't want what I want are just evil. I don't believe any sort of utopia can actually exist at all. I think if I had to call progress something, I would say that it moves in all directions simultaneously. It radiates outward, like ripples on a pond. Progress is simply the next thing you do. And everyone's got a different next thing. So a concept of political progress, a concept of progress beyond your own personal goals, just seems useless. In other words, if you're conceptualizing progress, you should only do so on an individual level. It's progress if you want to lose weight and then you lose 10 pounds. If your conception of progress is political, if it involves colonizing the minds of others and forcing people to engage with your narrowly defined ideas of not only how your life should be run, but how the whole world should be run, then I think you are automatically a tyrant. That's why all of these socialists and anarchists on the left are, to me, no different than fascists in the end. And frankly, same with the reactionaries too. Not because they have the same ideas, obviously they don't, but because they all have an anti-individual, hyper-dogmatic view of the world. They all think that they are the ones who know what a universal, perfect conception of progress is, and they will absolutely destroy everything in their pursuit of it. But for me, not everything is political. The personal isn't political. There are things outside the bounds of the state. And ultimately, progress is personal, not political. In this way, the policies of government can't be framed as progress or regress, as revolutionary or reactionary. And any such framing simply appears to be a power grab that relies on this idea of the end of history, that there can be a utopian perfection. It's no surprise to me that every single time we've chased it, millions of people have died. Yes, beware utopianism, beware people who think they got it all figured out for you, beware any sort of thing that's all the answers. That's what I say, just beware. I think learn more, learn more from everybody, learn about each land. Maybe you could use any sort of lens in any sort of situation. I think you should be versatile in that sort of way, but I lean towards anything that, that pushes towards personal freedom, liberty and all sorts of stuff too. But I definitely, like I said, I take to heart the criticisms about the way a community and a people jail. And I don't, I don't necessarily have the answers for all that yet and how to create something that doesn't get corrupt, corrupted, but can act as a political block. I have no idea really how to do that. Maybe we'll see something go somewhere with the Mises caucus be something we can ultimately get behind because I agree with Yarvin that libertarianism had largely been like a joke of an actual political bloc for, for a long time. These guys criticize democracy. Their criticisms are worth looking into and reading about. Like I said, the reason I wanted to cover this is I wanted to get more into how this affects some of the weird random Mormons who figured out ways that they can, well, that's not all Mormons. I mean, there's, well, we already know ex-Mormons kind of use uh, postmodern arguments in their own little ways, but there's stuff on the apologist side starting to, to use all these sorts of things. And I think even if you're a Mormon, if, if you're a believing Mormon, you should beware those types. Beware anybody who went out and figured out all the answers and collected the horcruxes. Beware. So we'll keep covering it in the future. Hopefully this made sense or wasn't too nutty, but it, it's go read more of Yarvin, Nick Land, <laughs> if you want. Academic agent is another one. There's a million one names because they're almost all kind of internet-y people and terminally online people as, as Sort Fata talk, talk, talks about it. Watch the distributist debate, Adam and Sitch. There's, wow, there's a million different things. The problem is, is most far leftists don't interact with these people enough. You can see Keith Woods do a couple debates and then he'll take on Marxists and take them on directly, but you'll see him also suddenly jag into ethno stuff. But the... It, the ethno stuff gets kind of strange when you're dealing with people who are Europeans and only Europeans. When you're seeing Irish people arguing for keeping their ethno state of Irish Catholic or whatever, it's a little bit of a different flavor than if it's Americans who we have this idea that we're supposed to be a melting pot 
being being exclusionary but it's it's a bit different when you see hungary or ireland doing it and you have douglas murray's book the strange strange death of europe where my parents are visiting ireland right now they actually got stuck there they're staying over an extra week because they got covid why are they interested in going and seeing ireland and if ireland becomes a complete melting pot for all of europe and africa and the whole entire world is it still ireland it's a different thing when you're dealing with Irish or Scottish people when they start talking about their ethno states. It's not not it's not like you're talking with people who have a history of slavery and all that stuff. It's the Scottish got into slave trading a bit more than the Irish ever did. But so I don't know. It's just it's just a different concept. It's a different concept when they start talking about that stuff, and then they're critical of how all of us Americans were so terrible about it, and they think that they can invent a future state as Alexander Dugan does because Alexander Dugan wants ethno states but also claims to be huge on human rights and social justice rights which is like what and he says he's very very on the side of the slavs and where the you know slavic concept came and and we always have to keep in in mind that, that to add into his postmodernism dugan's postmodernism is he's a moral relativist 100 percent moral relativist he thinks if we all live in a, in a mutual world. If there's going to be like an Iranian world or he, he divides the world into like these uh, kind of larger regions instead of their actual states. But he says like, if this region of the world is going to have the moral relativism of being super anti-gay, that you have to just go ahead and accept that in the world to be truly egalitarian and being able to, to live, live, you know, with each other and that sort of deal. And that's weird. It's all weird. And the thing is funny is like, they're smart. They're smart enough. They've covered enough stuff. There's enough detail on all these sorts of things. Even my criticisms, I bet you there's already a thousand, thousand long, 10,000 word long papers that get into nitty gritty detail explaining why I hadn't thought of this or that. And, but I mean, I think it's worth hearing anything. Karl Popper, I, I got into another argument with people this week and a lot of people brought it a lot of times Karl Popper said well what about the paradox of tolerance you got to be careful being tolerant of all sorts of different words Karl Popper very words state as long as it's before it gets to the level of violence it's always worth still just talking and thinking out and talking out with other sorts of stuff but the thing you find out with these guys is right now their so-called claimed true fascism their Ebola fascism or their Dugan fascism or their fourth way has this live and let live idea with it and i even thaddeus russell just this week on the podcast talked about world war ii and they kind of blamed on liberals the fact that hitler ever started killing jews because they think that they put him in a hostage situation and they think that the, even hitler back at the time was wanting to live and let live and and uh well, that's one of the it's one of the factions of this stuff. Keith Woods points to one of the factions of it being people who get hyper assessed about re-examining history in ways that you never thought of before. And uh, there's all sorts of stuff like right now we only have a view of history that basically is like we just if there's a right wing prosecution and a left wing prosecution and we're the jury, uh, 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 all we've ever heard is the left wing ones. There's so much stuff about so many different issues but there's some truth to that just this past week tom woods tom woods was on uh with via fry and Matt and uh barnes and they went through a bunch of history that stuff that you didn't realize that that was always that was always this way that was always that way there's so much stuff through history that we've only ever heard one by a uh, neoliberal view of it so i don't know i i think it's worth looking at i think it's worth getting into i think it's worth understanding uh, just like uh, Short Fat Atoko pointed to, I think you, if even open-minded progressives, as Yarvin wrote his letter to, if they wanted to know more about the world or have better arguments, they should actually listen to the arguments too. But I give that same critique to Peterson and Lindsay too. I, being leaning libertarian, I am a free speech near absolutist. I'd say pretty darn pretty darn near absolutist and a lot of people have those different little ideas like shouting fire in a theater which isn't even legal but you know there's other stuff maybe it's like immediate direct incitement or something like that but but um free speech free information free talk free learning it's always better it'll lead to i believe in my utopian liberal mind i believe that that will uh lead to better understanding or better ways of acting in the world.
my platonic dialectic. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we're all doomed. Maybe it's just going to blow up and uh, we'll be in a monarchy, a uh, uh, Curtis Yarvin design monarchy after the technocracy blows everything up. Maybe. After the later, folks. <laughs>